minus 30 seconds. T minus 20 seconds. You ready for do do more in the future? Trap yes. talk podcasts? Yes. Man. Only, only trap talk. Exclusive. Yes. Exclusive. Exclusive. <laughs> oh. So stop calling us. From the spot, get the club to pop. When I come up with the crop, gotta love it, love it, and not I'm hot from the hop to the club to spot. Get the club to pop. When I come up with the club to spot, get the club to pop. When I come up with the club to spot, get the club to pop. When I come up. You are now tapped into the coolest reptile podcast in the world. I'm your boy, MJ. What is good, everybody? If this is your first time tapping into your boy a favor. Hit that subscribe button. Hit that notification bell. That way on top of every single podcast I drop here on the Trap Talk with MJ YouTube channel. What is good, though, man? I feel good. Ready for tonight. 199th episode. Wow. Feeling good. I'm ready for 200 more like it's nothing. I uh, appreciate everyone in the early birds. I see you guys right there in the comments. I'll get to you guys in just a second. Uh, but yes, man, I would appreciate if you guys, especially if this is your first time tapping in, you're definitely want to hit that subscribe button. Much love. I appreciate you guys. You guys know how we get things started on this podcast, on this episode, on this show. Cobalt Cafe, number one, frozen thawed rodent business in the game. www.cobaltacafe.com. $30 flat rate shipping. Shout out to Desiree. Shout out to Steven. Shout out to John and Alex over at Sim Container. If you got eggs, put them in a Sim box. Less steps. Less stress. If it's a win, it's a sin. All day, every day. Shout out to uh, Stephen and Ashley over at Focus Cube Habitats. I finally got the shipping information on my brand new enclosures. I am so excited. Stay tuned for that. Please head over to Instagram. Give them a follow right now and go to their website. Shout out to Jesse over at Freedom Breeder, the number one stainless steel racks made in the United States. Much love and respect to the entire Freedom Breeder crew. Please go get yourself a Freedom Breeder rack immediately. It's the best thing on earth when it comes to putting your animals in a rack system, in my opinion. And then talk about best thing on earth. Look at this guy. Always evolving pythons. I appreciate you so much, Miguel Garcia. Day one homie. Day one supporter. This guy has influenced me so much to do what I do today in this reptile game. So I appreciate the big dog so much. Head over to Morph Market. Check out his ball pythons. Check out his YouTube channel. This guy's killing it on so many different levels. Shout out to the entire AEP family. Thank you for your love and support. And a shout out to my homie, my big brother, Alan, at Amazing Basins. Killing it with these basins. I'm telling you right now, he's very passionate, very dialed in. Head over to Instagram. Give him a follow. And if you're ever looking to become a basin owner and you want one of Alan's productions, best thing to do is hop on his Patreon page because that's the only way I think you're going to get There's so many people ready for this. And uh, it's not easy, man. Ferrari of snakes, in my opinion. Uh, so shout out to my boy, Alan. Thank you for your, uh, your support. It means a lot. And shout out to Blake Stewart over at Stewart Design. If you want to invest in your brand into the best position possible, head over to sdidentity.com. Check them out on Instagram. My boy Blake Stewart has made huge moves already in this industry. Has helped the biggest names in the game, help them with their brand change, and it's it's been it's been great from what I've seen. So shout out to my boy Blake Stewart. Shout out to Mark Bailey over at Mark Bailey Reptiles OG Triple OG. What a guy! Uh, thank you for your support. Please head over to Morph Market. Check out his productions. He is 
selling heat. It's been that way for a long time. And thank you for your support, Mark. And then shout out to the leaders of the industry. My boy Rami over at the Reptile Super Show. Number one show on the West Coast by far. Be ready, Anaheim. It's right around the corner, followed by Pomona. It's going to be amazing. And then shout out to Brian Potter and Bob Ashley over at NERBC, getting ready for Schaumburg right around the corner as well. Cannot wait to link with you guys at the end. next NERBC. I won't be at Schaumburg, but I will be at Arlington. Best believe that I will be at Titley. Best believe that. Either way, if you guys can head over to an NARBC or a Reptile Super Show, it will change your life. I'm telling you, you never know who you're going to link up with at a show. Anyone that you're that you're really inspired by via Instagram and, and Facebook, a lot of these people do show up to these shows, and that's where things really happen. So thank you to those four, uh, to those three guys for really making uh, such an amazing event for all of us to come together. And then I want to say shout out to um, Phil Goss over at US Art. The fight never stops. Head down to the link below. Become a US Arc member today. Shout out to you if you're a part of the US Arc team. Appreciate you so much. We are in this together. Uh, but seriously, guys, man, if you guys really want to have a peace of mind, I can tell you right now, investing into US Arc, who's investing into us, basically going to battle against all these legislations to keep our animal rights. So enough being said, man. Especially if you're new into this, you need to go down and go and do your part, just like the rest of us. U.S. Art is here to help us. Thank you, Phil Gossett. Go to YouTube, subscribe to the YouTube channel. And then please, man, if you want to see what I have going on more than the YouTube stuff, uh, more than the podcast and whatnot, head over to Instagram. Give me a follow, MJ Exotics Cartel with an A, not an E. Uh, just post some really cool uh, chondro babies that are just fresh in the egg. But, man, that's really exciting. Looking forward to that. So, yeah. And then, uh, you know, like I said, very active on the social media platform on Instagram. So hit me up if you ever need anything. Trap Talk with MJ Podcast. Make sure you follow that Instagram as well. Shout out to my Twitch viewers. Um, and then if you would like to support this channel more than a subscription, more than a like, please head over to PayPal and send me whatever donation you like. I accept it. I love it. You guys are awesome. I do this for full time. So if you guys really want to support me and you do want to send donations, feel free. PayPal, Exotics Cartel with an A, not an E. And then send whatever super chat you have. My boy Keith McPete is a legend. And I'm sure if you have a question out there and you really want to get an answer to it, send a super chat. Super chats will definitely be thrown on the teleprompt. Is that a teleprompt? I call it teleprompt. Fuck it, on the big screen. So yes. And then last but not least, shout out to my Patreon members, my heart, the Trap family growing by the day. I appreciate you guys so much. If you want more out of this podcast, if you want more out of this hobby, if you want to gain um, fucking a family, shit, go down to the link below. Join the Trap Talk Patreon family today. Come fuck with us. Uh, as soon as you join the Patreon uh, family, you get tapped into the Discord, and the Discord taps you into the whole family. And there's channels, a whole bunch of stuff that you can advertise your stuff, go back and forth, get information, get plugs, uh, anti-scam channels, you name it, man. We are out there looking out for each other. So thank you so much. I salute my Patreon members so much. You guys are my heart. And yeah, let's see. What is good? Here we go. Who is in the building? Who is ready for Keith McPete? I know I am. Here's my boy, Mike. Big Mike in the building, 1776 Exotics, Trap Talk, Patreon fan member all day, every day. The homie Mason Johnson, Trap Talk, Patreon fan member all day, every day. Thanks for tapping in. The homie Deviant Glass, what is good? Trap Talk, Patreon fan member all day, every day. The homie Josh, Scales, Fins, and Feathers collaboration going down next week. I'm not going to say any more, but go give my boy a follow right now on Instagram. He has big things popping, and he's definitely going to be making mad noise this year. Shout out to my boy Josh. And then shout out to the new Patreon member, the new family member, Robust Reptiles. Good to see your face. Awesome. Uh, thank you for joining the Patreon family. Uh, we'd love to have you, man. I hope you're having a good time so far. Trapper all day, every day. And then you got another trapper in the building, Austin Anderson. What is good, player? Patreon family member all day, every day. The homie Julio Fulio. What is good? Patreon family member all day, every day. The homie girl Chantel, Team Zoo Dreams. Patreon family member all day, every day. The homie Wise Guys. Forget about it. Thanks for tapping in. The homie Kevin, Four Pythons. OG Patreon fan member all day, every day. Thank you for your support. Sunshine State Offers, what is good? The lovely couple over at Florida, Born Exotics, my family members, what is good? Thank you for tapping in. Trap Talk Patreon fan member all day, every day. Jake Hole, what is good, player? Trap Talk Patreon fan member all day, every day. Then we got the homie Hissy Fit Reptiles, what is good? Trap Talk Patreon up there. All my Patreon members are here. I love it. Silver Cash, what is good? Trap Talk Patreon member all day, every day. Bruce Carpenter, what is good, Bruce? Thanks for being here. He's a Facebook guy, for sure. <laughs> Anyways, thanks for being here. I appreciate it. The homie Ryan Hyatt Balls, what is good? And we're going to end it on the homie. Actually, hold on. I can't end it on the homie Jay because I saw someone very, very player underneath that. Jay, what is good, Barbara? Jay, we're going to end it with my wife. Wife, what is good? 
Happy Baby Friday. What is that Baby Friday? What does that mean? Well, it is like Friday. This podcast is cracking, so this will make you feel like it's Friday. Either way, shout out to my wife. Thank you for being here. Appreciate everyone for being here because, like I said, this is going to be a very special podcast to me. If you really want to know the details on this uh, on this mission of getting Keith on the show, it goes all the way back to Unfiltered Reptile Podcast, back when our, our boy Forrest used to be with us. God rest his soul. But uh, Keith was definitely on that list. Top, top three people I told Forrest. We need to get him on. Um, either way, here we are, two and a half years later. Keith is uh, somebody highly respected on so many levels. Um, boa breeder, python breeder. Uh, I'm talking veteran herper, uh, you know, to say the least. But here he is tapping in with us. Keith McPeat. What is good, Keith? How you doing, MJ? Good to see you, man. You ready for this or what? Uh, I hope so, man. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, it's going to be good. Thank, hey, Keith, thank you for being here. Honestly, this is awesome. I mean, I know you've had a lot happen. Um, over the last year or so, but either way, yeah. you're here now, and thank you so much. How, how's everything going on your end, man? Speed us up on how, how everything's on your on your end. Ooh, set with my uh, health, so you know I was dealing with that, and the animals took a little back burner for a couple of months, but I'm back in the game. Everybody's on track. I got some good stuff happening this year. Reptiles are my life, and I was back in the game. Nice. You kind of broke up there just a little bit. You, you, you said something about your health. Can you repeat that real quick? Because you kind of broke up. Yeah. So um, I last diagnosed with prostate cancer. So uh, it took me a little bit of time to deal with that and, um, you know, put the animals on the back burner and get the support of the family to get past that hurdle. And uh, now I'm back, you know, feeling good, getting my head back straight and, uh, you know, back with the animals uh, full time and, and dealing with them and having a good time. Did you have to, like, give some stuff up or hand some stuff down because of the illness? Was it that bad where you had to, like, maybe dial some stuff down or, or were you OK with the upkeep of the, uh, the collection? Um, the good thing is, so uh, during the process, I had a couple emeralds drop and I had some Sanzinia drop wow. babies and um a couple other things. So I have a good support crew around me between my uh, son-in-laws and my daughters and, and my wife, they get down there and they do what they got to do for me, you know? Wow. So I couldn't even, I couldn't even make it down into the snake rooms. I had to stay upstairs and I would direct them on my cameras on what they needed to do. And uh, they got it done for me and kept it going until I could get back down into the rooms and start doing it myself, you know? And if and, and Keith, remind me, like, I mean, as far as, your illness did it creep up like did, did you have like slow like symptoms of you getting sick or did it just hit you all at once like what what, what was it like i'm just curious no nah, so you know i'm 62 now i would say when i was probably closing in on 50 i just started getting a psa test it's just simple blood test and it right. checks your prostate and listen they say every man if he lives long enough is going to get prostate cancer you know what I mean? Right. Like it might not hit you till you're in your 90s and you may only live to 88, but every guy eventually is going to have to deal with it if they live long enough, you know? So right. I just I just watched my PSA numbers with my doctor and it started going up and down and then it started climbing up all the time. And uh, so he did an MRI, couldn't find anything wrong with the MRI. He actually said, you know what? I don't think I'm going to see you for another year, but let's just do one more blood test. And it had spiked again. So he said, we're not going to screw around. Let's do a biopsy. They did the biopsy and it came back, um, you know, that I had cancer and it was at the level where they had to deal with it surgically or with radiation, you know, and had Craig Trumbauer and Howie Sherman in my corner talking wow. to them because they both have uh, dealt with this stuff. So, you know, I got some good advice from them and here I am, you know, got, got it behind me now. I got to be checked for five years, but as of right now, I'm cancer free and moving forward i mean i don't want to put like an idea on on how long you've been in this but the guys that you just dropped their names and, the, and them being your boys i mean holy shit like that's that just gives me an idea how far back you really go with this because those guys i mean are you kidding me like i i've only followed you guys for the last five years but just within this last five years i know like i don't want to know the exact history but i know you guys have pages back and chapters back on when how far back you guys go with this, which we'll get into in just a minute. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, yeah. I'm, glad, I'm glad, man, listen, Keith, you know, I, I know I reached out to you um, 
I don't know where you, I mean, do you remember where you were at in the stage of your health when I asked you and you said, I remember you, you were just getting out I of think surgery. I did. Yeah. I think I just, I think I just found out the first time we talked and then, um, you know, and then, and then when you had reached out that second time, I think I was actually in the hospital getting ready for surgery. <laughs> yeah. Wow. But it was a good well, distraction, man. It was a good distraction. You know, I needed, I yeah. needed to be with family and, and as Craig would call it, snake tune you know the world snake tune so i right. needed both of those things to keep my head straight you know all right well listen i'm, I'm glad we uh f- i mean listen family everything you know listen you got a good team i could tell you that much for yeah. you to be able to delegate from the couch or for wherever you're hanging out at and, and your you know your your wife and uh in-laws and you know kids are just up and ready to do it for you i mean that's the kind of stuff i've you know my wife she'd rather not do certain things but if i'm in a position where i can't no, no, no question asked. She'll, she will, even if it had to come down to feeding, if I had to feed these and I couldn't physically go do it, I know she would do it even though she would hate it. Like that's, and that's what you need to have when you have these kind of animals. You, you need to have a backup support. Oop. You there, Keith? Oop. Can you hear me? Yep. Can you hear me? Yeah. All good. All right. Anyways. So yeah, it, it's, it's, I'm, I'm, it's, it's great to hear that you had, family there ready to back you up you know because not everyone's so fortunate when shit like this happens Absolutely. you know so anyways yeah. glad you glad you am i coming in okay keith or is there a little bit of a lag no i can hear you good you're good okay. all right keith so one thing i'm dying to know man i want to know you know obviously i'm assuming oh, no, no, I <laughs> can you hear me yeah go ahead i'm sorry so I'm assuming I'm assuming you know reptiles is a big part of your life from from way back and and I kind of want to know at what point in your life did the breeding really start coming into uh, your life you know when did you really start having breeding plans with boas and whatnot? So animals of animals in general have been in my life since day one. My uncle was a uh, a veterinarian and he kept big cats. He had lions, tigers, jaguars. I would go to his house as a kid and he'd have a black panther loose in his house. Playing with wow. you know, chimpanzee. I mean, just come from a family. My mom always told me, hey, if you take care of it, you can get whatever you want. But the minute you stop taking care of anything, it's gone, you know. So it kept me kept me straight. You know, she she uh, used it as a tool to in parenting, which encouraged me to to do something positive and not something negative in my life so you know i always had animals in my life from day one um but in the beginning you know i'm we're talking back in 1960s uh, you would keep animals just to keep them alive and stuff but you i wasn't at that about breeding like some of the older generation of herpers at that time were doing you know i was just collecting at that time and then in the 70s, towards the late 70s, is really coming into my head and, and wanting to focus on, on breeding. And then by the early 80s, you know, I was already, you know, working with different lizards, a lot of lizards. That characters were one of the first boids that I had bred and, right. um, you know, some colubrids and all that kind of stuff. So it was like the early 80s when I really started focusing on, on breeding. And what... Remind me where you're at. Like, what, where, like you grew up in, uh, in the same area you're at today, correct? Where, where you at? Oh, there goes Keith. Huh. What is good? Good to see you guys. I hope this isn't like the whole episode because I really want to get a lot of information out of Keith. I think we'll be all right. A little bit of uh, – here he is. <laughs> What's that, up, Keith? I hope this is going to keep going like this. I, I don't know what the – problem is or maybe it's are, are, you, are you on a computer or are you on your phone let me ask you that i'm on a computer all right i could tell you right now nine out of ten times the phone works a lot better um we didn't have this issue during sound check so uh, uh, for whatever reason i, I got one here i can i can try to click onto that if you want me to give it a try yeah why, yeah why don't we exit out of here and get in, and go through the phone okay and i, I could probably right. tell you it's probably gonna work better okay so i'll see you in a bit we will make this happen okay don't worry about it. Keith seems super chill. He even seems like if he has to move to a better, you know, place with reception, he will. Anyways, I'm excited for this episode. I hope you guys are ready. I hope you guys are cozy. Get your get your drinks. Get your uh, snacks together because it's going to be a banging episode. I have list of questions for Keith. 
And shout out to Bull, uh, my boy Bill Stiegel with the uh, Keith McFreak comment. I don't know what that means, but uh, is he, does he get real freaky? Like, I don't, that Just kidding. Anyways, so yeah, guys, I'm excited. Uh, and if you guys are uh, just now tapping in, do your boy a favor. Hit that, get that like up. Let's get the likes up for my man Keith. Um, and hit that subscribe button. If it's your first time tapping in, please hit that subscribe button. Let's get the subscribe button. Listen, I love you, Bruce. Thank you, man. I appreciate the props. There's nothing to congratulate yet. You know how this goes. Yeah, there's 11 red neos in an egg. They could be dead tomorrow. I'm just kidding. Thank you, Bruce. I appreciate it. Yes, guys, I uh, have chondro eggs that uh, that pipped. And uh looks like 11. 11 red neonates. Not bad. I'm pretty excited because, uh, you know, yellow neo to a red neo. I assumed some yellow neos would be in the mix. Nope. All red neos. Pretty epic. Uh, guess a super... I guess they're called super reds or super dominants. I don't know. But if you want to tell me that there's no morphs in green tree pythons, explain a super red or a super dominant. Come on. That's a morph. I'm just kidding. I don't know what the fuck that is. I'm just Keith, 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 Keith. I need to smoke. I'm ready to smoke. Guys. Oh, here he is. Keith McPeak. Keith, enable your sound. Enable your sound. There's like a... Ask, ask to unmute. There we go. Can't unmute because... because the Oh, it says you're muted. How's that? There it is. There he is. Hey. 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 What's up, All buddy? right. I think we're going to be good now. I think we're going to be good now. Okay, no worries. Where did we leave off at? Oh, yes. Okay, I'm far. So the 80s. You, uh, We left off on you really getting into the breeding once the 80s came came, came around. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. And, and and even then, you know, you're, you're dealing with the mail around price list. There's no internet, um, you know, and, and you really don't even know who's around you or what other people are out there. So you're kind of just doing it for yourself. And then maybe getting rid of your offspring to a local pet store or something like that, believe it or not, you know? Uh, real quick, I asked you, where, where are you at? Where are you located? And, and, and is that where you grew up at? Yeah, I'm in uh, northern New Jersey. North. Oh, my, I should have known. You know, Guess who shared our podcast? Uh, God bless him. Uh, the, I guess the number one sexiest redhead uh, in the game. <laughs> Good old Gary. Good old Gary. Yeah. Which I, you know, he, he he's from New Jersey as well. What do you know? Two... Two big heavy hitters in the same state. I didn't. I wouldn't have. I wouldn't have thought that. Uh, how far are you from Gary? Uh, we're about an hour apart. I see him regularly, and Gary will come here, and I'll go out there, and we we chill. You know. Okay. Talk snakes, talk fish, whatever. <laughs> All right. So listen, go back to the '80s. Um, you know, who, who who are some of the people you're surrounding yourself around? Like, were, were you going to shows? Like. I mean, how are you really linking up with people and, and like really meeting other reptile guys? Or were you just solely on your own? Like, how, how was it, it back then? Yeah, it was solely on my own. Like, you know, um, I would get price, you know, you would you would find um, like priceless, like Tom Crutchfield um, right. and and um, Gary Sipperly. Um, you probably know that name out from yep. California. And um you know, Gulf Coast Reptiles and all those guys. That was like kind of in the early 90s when they really started coming around and you'd get those mail lists from them. But the shows, you know, until Orlando is what really broke. Uh, well, it was Orlando and then it, now it's in Daytona. That's the show that broke everything open. That's what busted this industry in this country open uh, wow. once that show really kicked off, you know, because everybody who was anybody from the whole country and around the world came to that show. It was insane in the beginning. Um, I don't know if you ever got to make it some some of the early shows, but I mean, it was standing room only, shoulder to shoulder. And, and at night, you just socialize with Dave and Tracy and, you know, a anybody who was anybody was at this show. So you just network like crazy at these shows so that when the show was over, you had telephone numbers of people you could call Don Hamper, Al Zulich, all these guys, you know, you just call them and, and wow. work deals that way, you know? So if we could kind of tap into some of the first projects that you really like 
kind of built a foundation on, you know, because I, I don't know if it was Pythons or Boas. So let's kind of talk about the first uh, first project that really kind of set you up for uh, for success here. Well, so like in the beginning, everybody's collection was eclectic. Everybody, you know, you wanted one one pair or a trio of everything you could get your hands on. Um, and that's how it started for me. You know, I would say probably the first project that I started like getting multiple animals and trying to produce large, um, you know, amounts of babies would be Burmese pythons, believe it or not. Um, and, you know, I used to produce a couple hundred of those every year. Um, and then, you know, I got into dwarf monitors, but blood pythons was the main thing. I worked with blood pythons and short tails for, you know, like over 20 years. Um, 2013 is kind of when I threw my hat in and said, you know, I was kind of done with that complex and moved on to other things. Um, I had done a lot of stuff with them, obviously, for that amount of time. I was one of the first, Tracy and I were actually the first to breed Borneo short tails in captivity the same year. Um, you know, there was the first time that they were captive born. Back then, everything was blood pythons, you know, but I, I worked with them. That was my main focus for a long time. Yeah, that's one of my crystal glow animals right there that you have to picture up. What, what, um, made, you was, get, what made you throw the – I'm sorry, I don't mean to cut you off, uh, Keith, but what made you kind of toss the hat in with these in 2013? Um, a couple things. First, my family started getting more, more mature, and um, I started wanting to spend more time with them. And, and when you – when you're in that game of producing, you know, if you want to call them morphs or different patterned animals and stuff like that, you got to keep so many damn animals. Um, and it's very competitive, you know, you're, you're always trying to, and that's not really what I was about. I'm always been about the animals and, and taking care of the animals and, and observing the animals and learning from the animals. But I did go after, you know, trying to create new looks for a long time. But then I want to go back to my roots, you know, so I love them still, but they're like an addiction to me. You know, if I got one back today, I would, I would be hooked on them and probably just start all over again, just getting a massive collection of those animals. And now I live vicariously through all my friends that are still in that, um, you know, complex and working and producing some amazing animals these days. But for me, I'm kind of back to basics. I like, uh, I like the natural look. Yeah. That was, a uh, animal if you notice like on its head that was a it's not, um, one of the, what is that that's a it's a borneo short tail but it's almost like a paradox um right. where it has these odd blotches um throughout the body that really shouldn't be where they're at um good friend of mine in florida got that animal when i got out that was uh yeah that animal was like 2013 in that picture when i got got out of the short tails and bloods how many did you have to uh, let go of? How many at that point? How big was your collection when you uh, parted ways with it? Um, breeder wise, I had like 50 breeders, but you know, with them, I could produce like maybe 200 animals a year. Right. Um, so, you know, I'm a full time working general contractor. You know, I've, I've been with wow. the company for 30 years. So, you know, I'm working, you know, like the average of 55, 60 hours a week and then trying to take care of a substantial collection of animals. Plus, you know, my family comes first. So, you know, it was, it was pretty overwhelming. And like I said, that's a real competitive game when you get, that's the blues. That was what the, one of the first perfect. animals. This looks insane. Keith, I yeah. was, I was, I was in a short tails for like a good two years, you know, and I, and I was, I had a good, good, good intentions on, you know, wanting to thrive in a project that I had building, and I was looking, you know, I saw a lot of gorgeous short tails. I never seen shit like this. I don't. This is nuts. Like, this yeah, is that that's uh, that's so. I I had gotten a, a ghost. I named it Ghost. It was wow. a almost like a hypomelanistic animal. It was a wild import, and I had gotten that animal. And just through selective line breeding, I was able to get these animals that would turn blue like this. Like they're like a slate blue. Jeez. And, uh, that's yeah. not either i mean look at the eyes the eyes are clear this is a this isn't like a snake in blue or no 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 that's just its color and um that that was always my thing with the short tails i like them better than the bloods because the bloods are basically um they're basically like a genetic uh mutation that you breed for right where the where the short tails are like you're breeding for looks and it's 
more involved, like trying to perfect the look. It's more like along the lines of, you know, like breeding dogs or something, you know, where you're trying to create a new type of at animal, you know, it, it, it's just, uh, bro, this looks like a ball python morph. It, it, yeah. That thing is really crazy. That, that I always went for Matt Minotola, a very good friend of mine. Yeah. Um, he's a brother to me. Matt likes the stripes, but I always liked these netted tiger like patterns. This was my kind of thing that I always went for where Matt just produced insanely striped animals. Um, but I always like this crazy uh, uh, net, net like pattern with the tiger stripes on the sides. That's one. Uh, that's one guy heavy on my hit list because I don't. I definitely don't bring enough short tail breeders onto the show uh, yeah. because I mean, not that there's not a lot out there. There's there's quite a bit of uh, short tail and blood python breeders out there that I follow that I like. But yeah. that Minotola, I mean, that guy right there. I've, I've heard a but lot of respectable stories about that guy yeah no matt's a great dude i've known him since day one when he's gotten into the short tails and he's taken him to amazing places and i might be biased because he's a good friend and family to me but he's got the best borneo collection in in the world to me you're not uh, the only yeah. one you're not the only one to say that for sure so yeah 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 all right yeah so um i'm, I'm curious uh keith you know because i did ask you to send me some photos that we, we may want to go over and of course, man, you gave me everything I asked for. I mean, you, you have a lot of stuff that you dabbled in, right? Um, yeah. so we just talked about the short tails. I'm curious about, um, you know, what boa species you were you were first tackling or first uh, passionate about working with. Um, if well, of mind. course, the the first things were boa constrictors, of course, because that was the iconic animal back in the day. So, right. um, you know, I definitely, uh, you know, was producing different. Um, Mostly it was Imperator and um, some Surinams and some um, Argentine boas and some hog isles back in the day. And right. I've gotten all those localities back. But the, the I guess the biggest thing for boa breeding for me was the uh, Sanzinia that I did way back in the day. Wow. Um, and I don't even know if it's true or not, but Tracy Barker, Eugene Bissett, and Philip Diverzo told me I was the first person to capture breed those in in captivity. Um, I don't know if anybody else, you know, a private person. I think a, I think the Jersey Trust Zoo bred them, but uh, I think I was the first private person to to breed those. So that was a pretty big big deal. Um, That's a huge deal. I mean, because even to this day, like we, we want all we want is to hear more Sanzinia production yeah. and to hear that you're one of the you know if you know if. If not, claiming to your friends, you're the first one to yeah. captive bred these in the United States. Yeah. Uh, wow. Well, what's what's the story with this one that you sent me? Is this one from back in the day, or, or is this no? Crazy? This is uh, this is one of the newer animals. This uh, so a lot of the animals actually, most of the animals that I have right now are on breeder loan with me um, through friends. Um, so wow. I'm working That's with you know a nice group of animals. Last year I produced, and I got a gravid girl right now. Um, so. I'm just working with the greens right now. Um, I, I don't really have the space to get into mandarins and the greens have always just been the thing for me, you know. But the the day that I um, came home, I wasn't even sure the Sanzini or Gravit or anything way back in the day when I did it the first time. And I was out fishing with my daughters and I came home really late. My wife was already in bed and the girls, I put them to bed and I go downstairs just to check everything one last time. And now uh, I look in there and there's all these baby Sanzinia crawling around, you know, and I was so excited. I just grabbed them all out. I ran up the stairs. And I'm like, my baby's had boas. My baby's had boas. I couldn't even talk straight. I was like all messed up, you know. <laughs> I think I found, I mean, I don't know. You tell me, when, when, when was this? Because this, this uh, looks like a OG picture in a, in a sense. When, when's this? Yeah, um, actually, that's a baby from last year. I, I don't even remember the year that I did it the first time anymore, to be honest with you. I'm wow. terrible at keeping records, but I it was agree. back when uh, when uh, the show was still in Orlando and not in Daytona, so it was a while ago. So your Sanzinias, you're, I mean, I'm assuming you cohab you were cohabit co excuse me, cohabitating them, right? They were, they were together, um, and that's probably maybe why you assumed or why it went, or did you have them paired up at a time? How, how do you think well, that I, I was doing Dumeril bows also at the time, and um, and you're right. What what really worked for me when breeding Dumeril bows is I couldn't just put a male with the female for a short duration of time. I found that if I put them together in October and I left them together until at least 
March or April and then separated them. I always got litters. If I just tried putting the mail in when I thought things were right, I never produced anything. So, you know, I was doing the same thing. I started once I got to Sanzinia, I started doing the same thing with them. You know, I put the mail with the female and just leave them together for a long time. But as you know, every, every collection, every of your ambient conditions, there are species that'll do fantastic for you. And then there's other species that just won't do well for you. And Sanzinia for me, like in my conditions, in my house, the way everything is, they just click for me. You know, I just do really well with them without, without a lot of effort, I think. Um, and other animals I struggle with and other people just crank them out like their, their popcorn, you know? So uh, I think my ambient conditions here are just really conducive to, to these Sanzinia and that's why I do well with them. I feel like, you, you know, good point to that is because, you know, I think everyone is meant to work with a certain species. You know, you just got to figure out which one that is because Bill yeah. Hughes, shout out to Bill Hughes. I had Bill Hughes on about a month or so ago and, you know, he's dabbled in quite a bit of stuff and nothing seems to hit home like the Sanzinias with him. He does really well right. with them. He just, right. and, and like, I mean, who, that's not a bad thing to be good at breeding Sanzinias. Right. Like, I, I'll take that and say, fuck everything else. I don't care. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But, go ahead. Well, yeah, because there's other people that are very capable breeders, but, you know, they, they'll slug out or, um, you know, not get um, any breeding activity or whatever with Sanzinia, and yet they're very capable breeders that crank out a lot of other animals, you know? So, yeah, I think your ambient conditions have a lot to do with it, a little bit of luck involved, you know? All right, so, Keith, lately I've been on a rampage, man, and I, I'm not that I'm out seeking for it, but listen, it's landing on my lap, and what I'm trying to say is I am – stacking investing in quite a bit of a northern emerald tree boa collection you know and I'm i've not seen about, i've seen your pictures i've seen your I'm pictures not, yeah okay maybe i have a couple imports just in case warren booth hears me and this will cause me a liar okay there's a couple imports <laughs> in, in the washroom right but in this room i'm sitting in quite a bit of a collection i'm obsessed i mean only because i don't feel like enough people are working with them first off right, right. Um, yeah. and, and, they're, and they're such a beautiful animal. They're a lot more affordable. If people can get them producing, they're going to be, you know, stat, uh, you know, significantly cheaper than a basin. I mean, yeah. I love basins, right? But they're just, they're never going to get cheaper. And not that well, they should, but. Right. Go ahead. The, the thing with basins is um, you got guys that have been in the game a long time, like Ed right. Marino and Steve right. Volk and, and, and Tony Nikolai and, and, and the others, you know? So. I don't want to, I've never like wanted to follow anybody else's path. I'm never going to catch them guys. You know what I mean? I'm going to be working with what they're working with where with the Northerns, there's like a lot of opportunity to try to like, listen, just breeding Northerns. There's not a lot of people working with them and breeding them. So that in itself is attractive to me, but I also, there's still that little bit of a breeder in me that wants to create more white on, on the, on them or wider bands or, or maybe, uh, you know, for anaconda phase with darker blotches or whatever it could be. I want to keep them natural looking, but I want to improve on what I think that natural look is. Um, so northerns to me are, are a better option, even though the basins are amazing. I mean, I have a basin here actually on loan from Paul. Um, nice. but um, And we're looking for a girl right now. But um, the northerns for sure to me are just a more attractive animal for me to try to breed. That, that animal there you have is what they, you know, coined the new locale because it has those two little white dots on its head. Right. And, uh, and they typically have, you know, wider um, saddles on their dorsal like that one does. On You know, some of them are amazing. If you went on Tony Nikolai's old site and looked at his original animal, um, that was an amazing, probably one of the best Northerns I've ever seen. And then Ryan produced out of his new locales that baby. I don't know if you saw it when you – didn't you interview Ryan a while ago too? Wilson? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah he, he produced a baby that's just amazing. I mean, it blows me away every time I see, see him post a picture. It's definitely one of the nicest Northerns out there. What what would be the what's the locality they're saying uh, the the ones with the white on the, on the so it, it's really just a it's just a misnomer it's it's so what they would say is that these animals came from a location that's so secret they just call it a new location that these animals came from but in reality they they'll filter in with any shipment of emeralds from the wild that um, are collected and I've talked to Ryan about it a little bit and. 
it, it's almost like these animals have so much white and the white has nowhere else to go. So you get these little dots on the head. I don't know. <laughs> right. And they, I don't know. I heard there was emeralds coming in, like, you know, labeled, like, on the border of Brazil and whatnot. Like, they're finding emeralds on the border of Brazil, you know, yeah. it being deep into Brazil. Um, and I'm wondering if that, you know, because, you know, one thing I'm starting to realize is how different these emerald, these northerns can look. You know, you got these oh, lime, absolutely. you got these lime green looking ones and then you have like your standard, you know, green looking ones uh, that are like the dark. And then you have these really nice, bold, uh, white stripe looking ones. Like, so, yeah. I mean, I, I well, even, even their head structure on the northerns can be a little yeah. bit different. You know, you can notice I, I like personally, I like the ones that have that angular head like that that guy in the picture kind of does but i've seen him even more angular and then you have some long and skinny heads too and you know even when you beef them up with the fat you know that that one has on its head you can see that you know it almost looks like an ass cheek sorry <laughs> but yeah. those fat those fat buildups on the head even even the narrow headed ones look different than the real angular headed ones so it could be something with localities you know I used to like a, I used to like to look at the head and favor like the sex of the snake by the head structure. Yeah. I don't feel like that's always the case either. Now that I have a lot more emeralds, yeah. um, like I didn't have a male with a fucking meaty head, and I'm like, wow, you could kind of pass for a female. I feel like, but I've seen plugs. I know it's a male. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, uh, but then I also have males with skinny head, like the slender heads, like you're saying. Yeah. You know? um, right. Every female I have has a bulldog head. I'll tell you that right now. Like. Every, every 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 northern I have has butt cheeks, just like you know, just yeah. like we're talking about, which yeah. I I admire. You know what I mean? Um, so I, I don't know. Um, I, I have to ask you because uh, you know I'm curious when you started approaching breeding with emeralds. You know, we'll, we'll, let's take it back then, if you don't mind. So I have had emeralds for a long time, and then I got out of emeralds for a while um, because my initial time with them wasn't really doing well. I, I was having the typical problems with the imports, you know, because back right. when we're doing them in the late earlies and uh, mean late eighties and early nineties, um, that's really what all you had to deal with was the imports, you know? Right. And um, so I wasn't um, too thrilled with how I was su being successful with them. So I just gave the projects up and then like 2010, 2011, I started acquiring more animals, uh, you know, I was talking to Harlan Wall and, and, you know, Ed and other people and, and just getting a good, good game plan. And I put together a group and started doing really well with them right away. So I was like, all right, I got, you know, a little bit more mojo behind me now and setting them up in a better way. And now they're doing really good. I had, believe it or not, I had in, in my early experiences with these guys, I had more problems with prolapse and regurgitation. Wow. Um, as, and, as babies or as they're adults, like what when, when, or as all stages, like what, 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 um, what, if they were full blown adults, I didn't have too much problem, but I always tried to get the youngest animals I could obviously, because they do better for you, you know, um, right. trying to establish a younger animal. So the younger animals always, always, always had problems with prolapses in the beginning. And it was just, you know, my caging and not understanding how much hydration is important more than anything else to these guys, you know? And if you don't mind kind of breaking down what could lead or what, like what, what kind of leads to a prolapse, would you say lack of hydration? Is that basically it? Or what, what, what leads to a, 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 a produced a United States captive born and bred emerald to prolapse? In my opinion, it's, it's a combination of being dehydrated and overfeeding and not letting your animal defecate in between right. meals. And, right. and and the dehydration part. So I know you've had Dennis McNamara on. I love Dennis. He's an awesome guy. And he said something. I might have even been on your show, but he he had said something where he said that he he waters his animals every day until they stop drinking at the zoo. And that really hit home with me. With like I provide water dishes and do really well with my emeralds, but I've started misting them more. And it's harder for us. Dennis has a setup where his cages drain so he can miss for, he says if the animals drink for 20 minutes, he misses them for that 20 minutes until they stop drinking. He missed them every day. And he does great with animals. So listen, Keith, I, 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 you know, obviously one thing I do is take a lot of notes. Like, like you said, the drinking thing, when Dennis dropped that information on the podcast, I was like, holy shit. 
I'm going to spray more. I was like, God right. damn it. They drink, you know, I'm in a good area too. And I don't, I'm, I'm in Southern California. I don't have to worry about cold for the most part. So I could get away with it, but I can tell you right now, the, the most recent emeralds that I inquired, did you spray them? They go fucking ape shit. They don't like it. I don't know what it yeah. is. Um, yeah. and I think because they've been, the way they've been kept, they, I don't think oh, they've ever been yeah. I, don't think, I don't think they've ever been sprayed. And I'm thinking maybe that's probably better to do outside. I do notice a lot of awesome things like Ian Vessel and whatnot have made like a little like playground thing for his uh, animal to crawl on. And he's, you know, he kind of yeah. hoses them down. And I feel like maybe that's maybe a, a better suitable place to try to get them used to getting sprayed. But right. I do know that's important. Like they get dumped on in the wild all the time. Like it just, right. it just pours on them. You know what I mean? So, um, but also Keith, one thing I do know is that if you don't, if you don't spray your animals so much, they will still drink like a, a fresh water. You know what I mean? Like I have these animals that don't like to get sprayed. I catch them chugging water. Like they literally will sit in their water bowl with their mouth. And I'm like, are they okay? And they're just sitting there for like a yeah. good 20 minutes, just with their mouth right. in the water. And uh, yeah. you know what I mean? So I, I don't know. It's um, the, the Well, I actually, I actually wrote a post about that the other day in one of the Emerald groups about – the, the importance of changing your water to get that reaction out of your emerald. Because if you don't change that water after two days, those emeralds, I don't care if that water looks spotless in that water bowl. If it's over two days old, they're not going to drink it. And you could take that water bowl out that looks spotless and full and dump it and put fresh water and put it back in the cage and that emerald's going to go. You're going to come back in five minutes. That animal's going to have its head buried in that water bowl. You know, and it's like, hello, why, how do people not like, this is logical. If you're paying attention, you can notice this right away. This is why I, I would like, you know, I had, came from the ball python game where there was a lot of like misinformation on how often you should feed your snake and how big of a meal, right? And then also one of them was how frequent you should change your water, which was once every seven days. And I just never understood that. Like I would come back to like the water just either being dumped or being shitted on within three days so i'm like right. how do people do water changes once every seven days and keep i get at facilities where i like they're showing me snakes and i'm like uh there's a fucking shed and a shit in the water oh well you know tomorrow's water changes fuck that do that right okay. now like what do you what do you mean tomorrow like i don't I don't work like that. I won't. I won't neglect water because it's not a Sunday. You know what I mean. And yeah. and a lot of people yeah. do that. They're structured, I, and I don't believe absolutely. in that, man. Like, give your snakes some water. You know what I mean. That's fucked up. Yeah. But, I, but, I, sorry, have to, I have to. I have to. Right. I have to be at my job at six thirty no, every morning. I have to be at my job at six thirty every morning, and the first thing I do is go down and check my animals. And if there's a water bowl that needs to be cleaned before I got to go to work at 6 30, it gets clean. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. But I also feel like if that's a habit you instill right off the bat, you'll always have fresh water. Like if, right. if, if the water is a priority, you'll maybe go three days at the most without changing water, but dude, just change the waters. I guarantee people sit in the room like, oh, all my chores are done. I did my water changes three days ago. Right. Fuck, do another water change. Like, are you kidding me? Get them right. fresh water, but I, I listen. I would have never, really, I, I would have never put the two together if it wasn't for having emeralds and condos. Because guess what? They're not in racks. I could see everything that they're doing. You know right. what I mean? People right. put ball pythons in a rack and they call it a day, and they, they leave for a fucking four days. You know? Absolutely. Yep. Agreed. So okay, listen. Let's let's talk more about the emerald breeding as far as trial and errors go. I mean, when was your first approach to pairing up northerns and whatnot? What can we talk about that? Yeah, so um, I think with boas and boids in general, you know, feeding regimes have a lot to do with cycling your animals. You know, you, you want to fast them and you want to feed them um, and have a season of plenty and a season of hardness, you know. And um, right. so with the emeralds, that was, you know, with, with short tails, believe it or not, the, my biggest cycling for them was lighting. I would just shorten my days and lengthen my days. But with emeralds, it's more about temps and feeding. Um, all my corrales, I have Roshan burger, I have annulated, I have um, so Hortolinus, um, and and right. all of those animals um, cycle mostly with food and and temps. Um, and and like you say, my biggest thing is observing animals. That's what I love to do. I can sit in my room, and I don't care if my snakes aren't even moving. I'll sit in my room for hours sometimes and just watch. And you right. know, I'll just be observing 
I don't care if they flick their tongue or they just turn their head. I'm like, why did they do, do that? What, what's going on? You know? And that's, that's my thing. You know, that's how I, I get away from the world. Um, and, and that's my little escape. So, you know, just watching the animals and watching how the food intake is, um, you know, starting to make the females build follicles and, and um, you just know when, you know, you can tell when the males, they give you the signs of either going well food or starting to really cruise their cage more and they're on the side that's next to the female. Like, you, you know, they'll tell you when they're ready to go and start pairing animals up. And typically if I add emeralds and, and I go back upstairs and, and I try to do it just before dark and I'll add the male to the female's cage. And if I go back down and he's not locked up within, you know, a few hours, I, I can tell she's not ready and, and there's no hormonal um, cues there and I'll just pop them back out and leave them for another week or two and then pop them back in. I wait until I see that breeding activity and then I'll leave them together for a while. Usually get, you know, three, four or five copulations out of that pair. And I try to breed just one male to one female. So let me ask you this. I mean, if you, like you said, you pair them together, you wait a few hours. If you don't see, you know, you don't see any action. And what I, when you mean by that, like, are they like, are they like, if they're separately perched, if they're perched together, like what, what are signs are you looking for, for you to be like, all right, I'm going to pull them out. Um, well, he, he should be all over licking her at the very least, you know, and, and tasting her and, and um, crawling over her back and, and you'll see his tail going right away and with his spurs working, you know, he's trying to get her to, from her coil position to drop the tail because, you know, they always have that twisty tie tail hanging down um, action when they're actually copulating. So, yeah, I look for the male to be all over that female. If he goes to a perch away from her and just coils up and settles down, I know it isn't the right time, you know, and I'll just pop him back out and, and I'll keep my feeding going. But on the other end, if he's all over her and you see some stuff going down and then he separates, you still leave him in there, right? Like yeah, absolutely. If you saw that there was good chemistry and that, that it, you know, they, they acknowledge each other and, they, and it is what it is, then, then that's a point in time where you would leave them together, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and Corallus are funny. Um, they, they, more than any other snake that I've kept anyway, definitely have a pairing preference. I've had pairs that I've put together where I know the female is ready with Hortolinus um, especially, but I've put them together and they just are tearing their cage apart. They're trying to kill each other. They're going nuts. And I can take that male out and put another male in and they're breeding right away. And, you know, I, I, there's definitely a pair compatibility um, thing with that where so having multiple animals is always a good thing. Having, you know, two, two to three males that you would be okay with breeding with a certain female is not a bad thing with these guys, you know, because one male, she may not, you know, they may not respond well together and, and getting that other male in there definitely will do the trick. Now I heard that there's even times where the males can be combative and they'll bite the females. Have you ever experienced anything like that before? No, my males tend to be smaller quite a bit than the females. Um, I don't know if that's an intimidation factor to them, but I've never, with caninus anyway, I've never had any aggression issues like that. No, I've never seen it. Now, I'm also curious here, uh, Keith, because, you know, I, I have close friends and, and other people I've spoken to and um, more of the basin topic here. Uh, you know, the basins put them through the ringer. You know, you hear a lot of crazy stories about, you know, things not going the right way um, when it comes to breeding basins. Um, and I'm curious, like, do you feel like breeding northerns are easier than basins, or do you feel like it could, it's it's the same story with northerns as well? Um, well, from what I've heard from a couple people, believe it or not, is that um, northerns are actually harder to breed. Um, a good friend John Martin, he's worked with both species, and 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 yeah, he's he's um, he he swears that basins are easier to breed than northerns and. I really don't have much experience with basins. I, I have, like I say, you know, there's one animal here right now. Um, and, and that's really it. I so, saw, you know, but I have a lot of friends like, you know, that have basins. So I talk to them and compare notes, but, um, yeah, I don't know. I couldn't really comment on the difference because I haven't really worked in bread basins. If you could help me in my position here, because I'm coming into the end of this year with, like three females. Well, I don't want to say three. Let's just say two females that are potentially 
like they're there. Like I've had them long enough. They're old enough, ready to get paired up. Right. Um, right. All the guests I've had on the show and all the notes I've been taking here. Um, food cycling is everything, right? Like this is so important when it comes to um, having a successful breeding project is the, the food I feel like. So in this case, you know, if you had a female that's big and she's been eating good, right? And we're like, we're in the spring, we're in the summertime in June, right? Um, when when does dialing the food happen, or when do you feel like you give them less food and then wait for that moment to increase? Like, when do you feel like that's the important time? Yeah, so I'll tell you that John Martin breeds his animals throughout the year. His litters vary from year to year um, to different months of the year, where I have a defined cycle. So I typically, um, you know, especially an adult female is, you know, adult animals are definitely going to be fed differently than juveniles that I'm growing up, obviously. But so the adult animals, you know, they're on, on a, like, you know, a one feeding to two feedings per month. Um, typically, that's a standard thing. And right. then when I start cooling down, obviously, I'll back off on that feeding regime and, and let them go by then the females, you know, I don't even put them into this cycle unless they have really good body weight. So then as I start cooling them down is when I back off on the feeding and then I'll start pairing up. And if I've seen two or three good copulations, then that's when I'm going to start increasing food back with that female. Got and, it. you know, and I start adding um, meals and when I see her building follicles, I'll always, and emeralds, it's a tricky thing because you, with all boas, I like giving that one big shot meal when I think the timing is right. And that's what gets them to ovulate for me. So with emeralds, though, you know, you gotta, you gotta be careful with that big meal, obviously. Um, right. But, you know, I'll hit them with one big meal after uh, maybe three or four weeks of feeding them a good size meal. And that's when I always seem to get them to ovulate after three or four good breedings. Now, boas, I mean, emeralds, um, from what I've witnessed, um, can get hit with stress really easily, and they can kind of, like, get, you know, RI and, and whatnot, um, or, like, you know, kind of do things where they're slowing down. Um, I don't know if you've ever dealt with that. I mean, have you ever dealt with a male or female kind of, like, not crashing, but just, you know, you pair them up, they're pairing, but then one happens to kind of go the other way and, and whatnot and, and, and in the health and, uh, department? What, have you dealt with any of that before? Um not really. I, I've had the animals that you 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 wonder if something's coming. You know how the emeralds when they 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 perch a certain way, they can pull their lips back, and, right. and you you see that gum line. And if you're not used to that, I, I've seen a lot of people in these groups, you know, freaking out that they think something's going on there. You know, right. so I've seen that like kind of get maybe a little bit more extreme when I'm in the cool period and I start like watching that and keeping an eye, making sure it doesn't go south on me. But I, I actually really don't experience RIs or anything with the animals, and and you're gonna you're probably gonna be like, what the heck? But I keep all my corrales ambient; they have no basking spots. Um, my room. I just <laughs> talked to this. I told Warren this. I do the same thing. Okay, <laughs> listen, my females have a basking. I, my females, it's 88 during the daytime, uh, but then nighttime just drops to regular, right? But I all my males, all my juveniles, all my sub-adults, basically I want to say at least 10 emeralds have no back heat. All yeah. all, all room heat, and it all adjusts with the ambient. Uh, and yeah. Warren, Warren didn't tell me, oh, you shouldn't do that. He was just like, well, you know, things need to uh, thermoregulate, you know what I mean? But well, I'm like, once I see my females ovulate, I, so I have, a, I have like a breeding room, and then I have kind of a grow-up room. So once I see animals ovulate, I'll, I'll move my corralis into the warmer room and I put them on a high shelf, but it's still only ambient. But right. you'll see the female, and I have a fans in these rooms that blow the, the air around and all, but you'll see the females, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll hug the front of that container once they're gravid. And, so um, what are the heats getting up to then? I mean, what's at that point? Like, what do you, what, 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 where's the room getting at, at the, at the highest tops, uh, tops, 84 and a half, 85 during the whole pregnancy, everything like during everything. Yeah. Whoa, dude, this is yeah. game changing. Uh, maybe, maybe people are overheating your shit then if that's the case. 
I don't know. It's, it's always worked for me. You know, there's some species it doesn't work well with, but for, for me with Corallus, it definitely works really well. And, and um, yeah, I, I don't provide them with it. Okay. Awesome. Um, and, you know, I'm curious, you know, as far as the, the establishing goes of a, a baby Northern, um, was that kind of a, a easy thing for you to get going or were, were those kind of give you a run for the money? What was that like? Well, yeah, no, establishing babies can be a little bit tricky for sure. Um, because, you, you know, you, you can definitely hit northerns, I think. Um, you can't hit them as hard, I think, as basins, from my understanding. You know, like you have to be a little bit more conscious of the food um, size and frequency with northerns compared to, to the basins, I believe, just from what I've talked to John and other people with. Um they, they seem to be really relatively eager to take live hopper mice for me. I get really small ones, um, which really nutritionally wise aren't the greatest for them, but it will get them feeding and get them um, to the size where I can start giving them a more appropriate, healthier diet. But I, the movement of a live hopper mouse um, in a tall tub just seems to work really well. And I have found that um, if I have a real stubborn feeder, um, that in a sterile setup just won't get going for me. I add pothos like crazy all through the branches and just let them get all tangled up in that pothos and a lot of branches to give them that security that they need. That if you just have a sterile wow. environment with just a perch, they, they I think they feel too exposed and they're just worrying about survival and not feeding, you know. But if you give them a lot of security, um, they seem to do really well on getting going and would you give that tip for chondro babies as well? <laughs> Con chondro babies, there's other people you got to talk to about chondro babies, but I'm not the guy. <laughs> and I, at the end of the day, I mean, I, what works for one snake has to work for the other. You know, I don't give a yeah. fuck or a python. I mean, right. I, I would say a lot of a lot of the things that I've noticed that everyone does, which is obviously ideal, is putting a baby neo in a stair -like tub where it's just over water or over a, 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 a cup of water. But I, yeah. I rarely see it covered with plants. I will say Christopher Rice. Shout out to Christopher Rice. My boy Christopher Rice, call him Coach Rice. I see that he has a lot of like, you know, plant, you know, plants, even fake plants going through the thing where it's not so visible. Like it's not where you could see right through. And I'm just curious if that should be like, you know, should everyone set up their neonate uh, tubs for that, for that first initial setup? Like right yeah. on the yeah, Gary, Gary Savino and um, and Ian Bissell and, and Harlan Wall are the names that pop into my head. That would be the guys to talk to on baby chondros for sure and how to get them going because I've seen them work some pretty magic with, you know, they've gotten animals from people that aren't doing well with them and they'll take them to get them started for them and they, they got the tricks under their belts to get those little guys going. Bill Stiegel too, obviously, he does really well with them too. Yeah. I, will, I will say, though, Keith, I'm going to get this off my chest and I'll feel better. I got a little bone to pick with Gary. Um, you know, God, God bless him. He gives me all the props in the world. He supports me. I know I, I get real support from Gary. I know it. I see it, right? Yeah. Can't get him on my podcast. Um, you know what I mean? And, and, and I already know what kind of show that would be. And I know, I know why he's not on it. But he just had a podcast with Morelia Python Radio. Shout out to those guys. They're OGs. But that, that hurt my soul, Keith. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah, you, know bad, yeah. you, know, you know how bad I want Gary on this show? I'll put some pressure on him for you. I appreciate it. Listen, <laughs> listen, I don't ask for much, but Gary Shabino, if you're listening, give your guy a chance, please. I won't yeah. smoke. I won't smoke the whole episode. I promise. <laughs> I'll put the bong down. You know what I mean? For Gary. <laughs> but Okay, with all due respect, I will say, um, you know, going back to uh, the establishment part, um, did you feel like – I don't know. At that point, when you had these northerns going on, how much other stuff was on your plate? Like, I always feel like you had multiple projects going on, I'm assuming, right? Yeah, I, I, I definitely, for a long time, and even still today, I guess, um, you know, I have probably more northerns in my collection than any other species as far as the amount of animals for that species. But um, I have a lot of stuff. I have like a lot of colubrids and pythons and you know, different boas and all, but, you know, I have, I, I think close to like 30 emeralds right now. Um, Damn. Yeah. 30 emeralds yeah. currently. That's your collection right now. 30 emeralds. Yeah. But I have a lot of this stuff too. <laughs> right. Like yeah, I'm sure. 
damn, 30 emeralds. I love hearing that. And and, yeah. and then and then you have the one base in mail, correct? That you're it's uh the yeah. go for. Yep. Yep. Wow. Yeah. Okay. All right. Listen. Um let's talk about some of the uh, other stuff uh, that you're currently working with today. I mean, obviously we're talking about the emeralds, but I mean, what are, you know, I saw R- Rush and Burger Eye, which we haven't showed yet. I mean, are you messing with any of those still or what's going on with that? Oh yeah. I, I have a gravity female right now. What? Um, yeah. <laughs> gravity female. Okay. Yeah, okay. Hold on. Are these, are, what's going on? Is this like a, re- a repeat thing or have, when was the last time you bred these? What's going on? Cause I'm um, a huge I, Yeah. I breed them up. Uh, pretty much every other year um i i give them a year off and then i i do a breeding year and she's grabbing again this year oh um so God. yeah i love them i mean you know I, look at that i need this so bad keith help me yeah. out can i can i get on a list or something what do you need for yeah that? yeah what i'll is- put you on the list i definitely put you on the list oh warren i'm your next warren because you know warren's successful at breeding these oh guys. yeah warren's warren's a man yeah um, so I, I love any I love any snake that starts looking like from the head as one species, and as you go to the tail, it looks like a different species. You know, like I love Jamaican boas, and I love um, you know like yellowtail kribos, and and these Russian burger I fall into that category too. You know, like they just look like different snakes sewn together. I mean, look at that tail on that thing. That thing's awesome. I love them, and they have these big black shark eyes. You know. Now, I mean, would you kind of put these on the same uh, category as far as easy keeping goes like, as the Sanzinia? Or are these more kind of more on the finicky, not that northerns are finicky, but more of like things can go wrong like northerns? Like where these sit at? No, these guys are definitely uh, fairly hardy. Um, they're definitely uh, another species that will spend some time on the ground. Um, they're mostly arboreal, but um, they'll, they'll go under a hide and, and – sit there for a few days before they go back up in the branches. Um, they're more like uh, Hortolinus, I guess, than Corallus for sure, than uh, Caninus for sure. Um, right. They, they, uh, they're pretty hardy animals though, for sure. Okay. Now, you know, one thing I will say, misconception for sure is how every, well, they said it's about chondros too, but like how Northerns, you can't handle them. They're fucking mean, which case by case, right? I, all these damn snakes have personalities for one thing. And if it's in a good place and it's long-term kept, it does – a snake will chill out for the most part. But some yeah. just have a nasty attitude. And and I'm, I've heard different things about, you know, the, the Russian burger. I, are, are, are yours pretty nasty? You can be honest. or, or... No. So, in all – honestly, I like an edge on all my animals. I really True. do. I do. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't like that limp noodle syndrome of snakes. I really don't think those snakes live lo- as long as – snakes that kind of have this little bit of an edge to them and i like giving them the respect they deserve you know what i mean so i like them calm enough in captivity that they're not stressed by me being in the room and moving around and anything but i'll give them their space i'm like i'm not a guy that needs to handle them all the time so having said that these guys definitely um will keep an eye on you but I could see where you could have them very handleable if you work with them all the time. Right. Um, but I, I typically, you know, I have removable perches for all my arboreal stuff so that I can just take them out on the purse. Now I can have my hand one foot away from that female and she'll hand and check me out while I lift her out on the perch and go move her to a stand while I clean her cage. But she doesn't strike out or, or try to nail me every time like, like most Amazon just track my hand and keep an eye on me and make sure that I'm not going to be messing with her. But they give me the sense that if you wanted to work with them, um, they would, you know, from day one, especially. I have to ask you, Keith, you know, with, with you being in this industry for as long as you have, um, and you, you have, you see people doing different protocols on being safe and clean and whatnot. Um, what is your, what is your take on handling altogether? I mean, do you feel like, these animals should be handled less and just like, yeah, occasional, whatever. But, you know, you have some people who believe in handling like, oh, they like to be held and whatnot. Or like they believe in holding the animal more than, it, you know, more than it being uh, in the enclosure. And, you know, then you have some people wearing gloves, you know, all the time and whatnot. Right. And I'm just kind of serious. Yeah. Like, I'm kind of curious where, where your stand is on that. So I'm definitely old school. Uh, my animals go through a 90 day quarantine minimum. 
Um, but once their quarantine is over and I deem them healthy, they go into my collection. Now, it can be a rhino rat snake. It can be a California king snake. It can be a bull and I. Once they've gotten right. through that and they're in my collection, they're in my collection. And if I'm handling my king snake, I may I may um, use a little Perel before I go to the bull and ice cage or something. But I don't, I don't I'm just old school. I'm not saying it's right or wrong. That's just how I handle my collection. You know what I mean? But um, I don't know if you know who Gavin Bedford is from Australia. I heard um, of Gavin. So I yeah, he, he, Go ahead. He's a legend. You know, he, he's, he's definitely, if I could have a bromance with anybody, it would be Gavin Bedford. He's, he's an awesome dude. <laughs> and I got to meet him when uh, me and the NPR boys went over to Australia. And Gavin does all amazing work with the own Pelly Pythons. He's really trying to um, create a captive population of those things. So, you know, Wow. Um, you know, he's trying to save that species for sure. But anyway, so Gavin and I have had lengthy conversations about the limp noodle syndrome. You know, have you ever seen like these big Burmese pythons that have been used for educational shows and they're just like, like they're, they're just there. Yeah, there's no muscle tone, there's nothing to them. A friend of mine used to use berms for shows all the time, and his animals never lived that long. You know, if he got 10 years out of an animal, that was it. And 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 Gavin and I both believe that these animals will like almost give up on life at some point. Like you, you just take that wildness out of them. Um, I think it's good to have animals that are used to you and used to being handled. So you're not stressing them out, but you can overdo it. I don't think you need to be holding them while you're watching TV and riding your bike and doing this and doing like I see some people do, um, you know, Maybe they get away with it. Maybe they do good. It's just like I say, I'm old school and that kind of, I want to see my animals being wild. I don't want to humanize them uh, too much. You know, I like to keep them what they are, what Mother Nature intended them to be. You know, that's what I like to observe. Now, what about, you know, as far as people, you know, obviously, you know, nidovirus is something talked about quite often nowadays. You know, a lot of people aren't shy to talk about, especially on this podcast, right. we address it, crypto and all this other stuff. Um, how much of this have you had to deal have to had to deal with or be concerned about throughout your time of uh, of keeping uh, her? I would say when I was heavy into blood pythons, that there was probably animals that had nido, and none of us at the time even knew it. Like right. even even Burmese pythons, I'm going to say because one of the things that always happened with those animals with me and every everybody else breeding them at the time was. Come winter time, come time when you start breeding them, they would all get RIs. Like every winter, you know, we'd get these RIs. And, and, and we weren't doing anything that crazy. We weren't cooling them down that much or anything else. But I think the stress of breeding brought out whatever virus that, you know, these animals had in them at that time out to the point. They called it getting the snots. You know, I can remember talking to Mark Bell. Dude, you know? I had that. That happened to me this year, and I fucking went into crazy, like, what? My ball python. I never had any of this happen to me. And then, I, of course, Nido tested it, and yeah. thank God I clean. You know what I mean? Right. That's why I also – I don't think all – you know, not all RI leads to Nido for one thing. You know right. What I mean, I mean, multiple cases of it, and even the snot shit. Like, this shit was snot. Like, when I had the Q-tip, I was like, oh, my God. I was like, this thing has fucking – what is this? Like, I yeah. for sure thought this thing was coming back positive. Uh, but right. You know, all back negative but still like you know I, I feel like a lot of people especially in the ball python community just they, they just don't want to address it and they don't care because what are they going to do a lot i mean think about how big a lot of people ball pythons collections are like what the right. fuck are you going to do like you're going to you're going to invest that much money to test a thousand animals you know what i mean right uh, right the truth of the matter is it's out there you know what i mean and, it, it's it's probably been in everybody if anybody's got any kind of a substantial collection and been doing the game long enough it's probably been in their collection at one time or another for sure but it's, um, but it's not the end of the world is what i'm also getting at too you know what i mean like you you have to you have to delegate it you have to address it you have to be aware of it you know what i mean yeah and you sure as hell shouldn't sell sick animals that's the right. biggest i mean that's like I mean, you're just destroying all of us by doing that. You know what I mean? Absolutely. And, and I, feel, I feel like right now, because of social media and the power of, you know, getting your voice out there on a platform, a lot of people are not scared to bring their concerns to the fucking table. You know what I mean? Right. Um, but the thing is, like, a lot of these new keepers or people who, who never dealt with Nido and they're just now reading up on it need to understand that this shit has always been around. This isn't right. like fucking like a, you know, 
I mean, it's like COVID. COVID is just it just got labeled something, but COVID's always been around. You know what I mean? Like, right. like it's 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 a it's an illness. You know what I mean? Right. But you have to address it. You have to work around. It. You got to do what you got to do. Unfortunately, if you have a breakout, I do feel like you got to figure out and test your animals. And and if you don't want to, well, then why do you have so many animals? I don't know. I don't know. What right. To say. I, I think Buddy Buscemi, right? Uh, I don't know if you follow Buddy at all, but I think you know Buddy. Buddy was pretty open about having it in his collection and all. But I think, you know, I think some animals in his collection, if I if I remember correctly, um, you know, he took really good care of, and and just like waited to see what was going to happen and kept doing you know better and better with the animal. And eventually, he got the animals where they were seemingly healthy and doing great, and tested them, and they didn't even test positive anymore. Right. So it's like, you know, can can the animals beat this virus if, if they're, you know, given the proper care? I, I, I don't know. I think what it comes down to is the some animals being able to live through it. Like you said, there's the come wintertime, some get sick. And I feel like some get it to the point where they will die. And that's a bad case of Nido. You know what I mean? Right. But you're, I will say it, it shouldn't be normal for all your males to be getting sick every winter. Like right. That's you're having that. That's you. That's something you need to address. You know what I mean? Right. This, this is my first, even though I haven't been breeding a long time. This is a, a, a proven breeder male that came in from somebody else who's done a lot of work. So I mean, he is a little bit older and whatnot. And and I did breed him to like four four or five different girls. You know what I mean? And I put him through the ringer. And I feel like that's where I fucked up. And you know, he bounced back. He's good. He's eating. You know what I mean? And and luckily no Nido. But it shouldn't be normal. You know, I have a lot of people right. that. I, talking to lately especially ball python keepers who are like it's so common for certain snakes to get sick every year and i'm like well that's not that shouldn't right. that shouldn't be normal you know and i feel like they're rather just not like well to us it's normal and we don't give a fuck you know what i mean like right you know i mean because from what we all understand babies don't carry the, the disease right like when, when right. babies are born for the most part they don't they're not born with nido i mean is that is that correct that's my understanding that my understanding is uh with green trees anyway that um if the parents are positive um that the the babies aren't going to be positive just because they were born out of an animal that was positive for night out how often are you doing any testing in your own facility like i mean do you have yearly tests or anything my, like my collection is really pretty close i really don't suffer from um any outbreaks of anything you know what i mean i'm not i'm not really bringing animals into my collection i i did from 2013 till about 2016 or 17 but since then it's been pretty much just slow growing stuff and and working with what i got you know and keeping babies back and that kind of thing right right okay um now one thing that we're going to tap into, I don't want to call it the meat and potatoes, but I don't know how you could top this species of snake. It's the dream species, man, the bull and I, you know, bull and python. Um, yeah. I want to know, you know, obviously Pete, that, or excuse me, uh, Keith, that's what drew my attention to your Facebook page. Uh, I don't know if you had a profile pic. I don't know where I saw it, but I just saw you working with your bullens. I don't know if it was a video, but I was so just like, one of the first times I saw a real, a, a big bullens and I couldn't believe it. Um, but yeah. ever since then, I've always seen you passionate about them and I'm curious how far back these go with you. Like when did, when did you start dabbling into, to keeping the bull and I? Um, so I did have bull and I back in the day when they were allowed to be imported as wild caught adults, um, back, uh, you know, Tracy Barker had gotten a gravid female in and, and had, uh, she dropped some eggs that was the first successful captive hatching of eggs she didn't breed them they came in gravid but back around that time i had an animal and um they did real poorly back then they they uh they came in and they, they would instantly their head would swell up um wow. there's my, that's my big girl there um their head would swell up they'd get like mouth infections and they did very poorly nobody was even keeping them alive and then actually in 2013 when i got out of the bloods i took a lot of that money and i invested in um like six animals. And I said, you know what, this is going to be my, my thing. This is what I'm going to work with what I'm going to, you know, just focus on. And I'm just going to deal with these six animals. And of course that didn't happen. I just couldn't resist my passion and started getting other things, but bull and I are my, I was talking to Ryan young on Facebook today and they're my white whale. You know, I, it's just something that I'm chasing and trying to figure out and, 
you know, I know people that have been successful, but I, nobody's got them figured out yet. Even the people that are dear friends of mine and they, you know, Frederick Isinger has bred him five times and, you know, he moved and that in itself just shut down his success. So where was he at? Where was he established at when he was breeding these? He's in Sweden and okay. he's, he's still there, but, you know, he just moved to a different house and it shut down his, his breeding. Wow. And, and, and I know Frederick very well and I've known him for many years and there's no secrets. We talk very openly between right. us and, and Frederick doesn't even know what he's doing differently than I am to be successful. You know, we'll compare notes on what we're doing. I'll, I'll say I'm doing this right now. And he goes, that's perfect. That's what I would be doing. Right. So there's, there's something there. The breedings right now to me are just an anomaly. Um, they're not anything where anybody can say, I got these things figured out yet. Cause no, nobody does. Well, no. you know, what? Here, here's the one thing I love about like, from what I've ever spoken, like a, a legitimate, um, respectable chondro breeder like literally every legit chondro breeder i've spoken to tells me to this day they still don't know what the fuck they're doing and <laughs> and, 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 and that's it's because it's like, there's no there's no repeated of like a positive results like you're, you're gonna deal with some horse shit at some point and you right. can't figure it out uh right. but this right here is like the, the pinnacle of all that because you have you know shout out to ari flaggle you know good good buddy of ours um yeah. His whole life has been wrapped around this species, and and I know someday it's coming to him for sure. I feel it. Um, but you know, th this is just something not hardly anyone, especially in the United States, can figure out. I think the last guy I saw who had eggs and almost a full developed animal, uh, but dead in the egg was Josh Jensen. Was that his name? Josh Jensen, I believe. Hansen, uh, yeah, Hansen, Hansen. Okay, Josh Hansen, yeah, Josh Hansen is ball python. Oh, my bad, Josh Hansen. Right, which I had high hopes for that. I remember he was updating us and whatnot. And yeah. I remember he posted a pic of a fully developed Bolins. I don't know what, what what looked wrong with it, and it was just dead. And I was like, yeah. what the, oh, you've got to be kidding me. To go that far to, to, to see, which is still an accomplishment, I feel like. But, oh, absolutely. Yeah, well, it's, so it's all the Bolin guys, we all talk behind the scenes, you know. So most of the guys that have been successful, I've talked with, obviously, back and forth. And, um, you know, Josh, you know, again, he, he acquired the animal. I think one of the biggest keys, um, you know, there's got to be something that we're missing, obviously. I, I don't think it's just a matter of too many people have tried. The Barkers have tried. Don Hamper's tried. Like, I could name the biggest names in the industry that have tried breeding these guys, and they haven't been successful. And then people have gotten them, and they'll have a, a, a clutch and usually, you know, there's one, maybe two, maybe three babies that come out of it and the rest are slugs. Um, and then they're never successful again. Um, Jason Balin, very accomplished, you know, very respectable breeder, uh, really knows his shit. And, you know, he, he got one baby out one time and then hasn't been able, was never able to reproduce that. Um, you know, so it's just, it's just, I don't know what it is here with them. You know, there, there could be, maybe there's a virus thing with them that, we don't know about or can't test for um that's inside of them um so there's such a strength see that picture you put up right there that's that's your goal your goal is to keep your animal right. a bull and i looking like that and and yeah. a bull and i will feed and and make you think everything is right but when things are wrong they don't look like that right they're they get dull their, their scales rough up and, and fluff out almost like a sick bird. Um, they coil a lot in a tight ball. Um, you can just tell they're not feeling well, yet they're eating and stuff. So if you're not paying attention to your animals, they're like, oh, they're doing fine. They're eating, they're pooping, they're drinking, they're surviving, they're not losing weight. But if they don't have that glow on them at all times, there's something off. So my, that's what my goal is now. My goal is to keep them looking like that and just stick to a routine of putting them together, food cycling them, just normal, nothing crazy, just normal python husbandry and just keeping them looking like that. That's what my goal is right now. Hey, Keith, I'm going to ask you a question. And why you do that, I'm, my, my internet's acting finicky, so I'm going to head out and come right back in. But I, I, I okay. want you to kind of explain – I want you to explain – the temp different the, the difference in temp and altitude and whatnot with these because as much as you would keep these like a python species it's not like that when it comes to the to, to the ambient temps is that correct correct yeah they're the wild habitat on these guys you know they're from six thousand feet and above 
and Papua. Um, so they come from a very high elevation. And if you watch any of Ari's videos when he's in the land of Bolanai and he's with his guides and they're walking around, they got jackets on, they got long pants on. And, you know, when the sun comes out, yeah, it's in the 80s and stuff there. But the background there is cool, damp, misty cloud force, you know. Um, that's Serpents in the Clouds, the book Ari wrote, and I got to write in also. But Ari's book uh, uh, is amazing detail of the habitat that these animals come from. Um, in captivity, I have, I have in my quest to try to be successful with them and replicate nature, which always does not work in captivity. Um, but I have brought these animals down to the mid forties and you can do that in a short duration of time and suffer no ill effects. But if you try to do it in what we would think is a normal cooling season for a Python, you're going to have issues with them. Um, so Aria's tent in their burrows and generally that temp is 72 to 74 degrees that's the constant background temp that these animals no matter what the weather is outside they can get in this rotten vegetation of these burrows and 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 maintain a 72 to 74 degree um temperature so i try to keep my ambient so the what i came up with was i live in northern new jersey all the houses here have basements and they all have concrete floors so what i did was i built cages that the floor of the cage is the concrete of the basement floor wow so that's cool wow right it's always 65 degrees on the, the wow. slab of that so by doing that now i could keep a cool ambient in my snake rooms that is typically 84 degrees but they're going to be if they're on that substrate they're going to be at you know 65 to 70 degrees and then i give them a, a basking spot that's higher up in elevation so they have to work to get up to that elevation if they want to bask and i have tunnels that separate the cages that they can go back and forth and then i also have a tunnel that goes into a warm snake room so they can they can get into that um warm burrow no matter what the temperature of that cage does. So I've given them plenty of options um, uh, to work with from 65 up to like 84, 85 degrees is their basking spot. And that seems to keep them in that glowing, perfect looking condition. Now, you know, as far as, you know, the, the approach on feeding these, um, I don't want to say these are like something like a retic, right? You don't, you're not blasting these with food. Is that correct? Yeah, so we really don't know what they're feeding on in the wild. Um, the the biggest thought is, and I guess from some sampling, is this ground couscous, which Ari says is about you know a six pound animal as an adult, um, but it's a pr pretty formidable prey item for these guys. Um, so if they're going in there and they're killing them in the burrows, um, that. Uh, scenario for that snake to tackle an animal of that size and how they're capable to defend themselves. Um, so I would think that maybe they're securing larger meals, but less frequently than in, in the wild. Ari says there's not a lot of bird um, birds in that area, and they're one of the only reptile species in that area. Ari's seen some smaller lizards and stuff that maybe the juveniles are feeding on. But um, it seems like that mammalian prey for them is the, uh, the main thing. So being a cooler species, right? So in the early days, a lot of people were keeping them really warm and everybody would complain that their metabolism so fast and they're shitting all over the cage and they're so hard to keep clean. But keeping them cooler and giving them just a hot spot, that all goes away. I don't notice anything different in their defecation from any other python now. In the early days, it was a you know a real mess to take care of these guys. Um, Brian Sharp and all these other guys would you know cuss them out all the time, but now we're keeping them a little bit cooler. Um, that definitely seems to have slowed the metabolism down, probably to a more natural thing. Um, so they take their time digesting. Um, they can put weight on very easily and very quickly. So you have to kind of watch that. Um, so I feed them sparingly. They, they, when I'm not in a breeding cycle, they'll be fed um, maybe once to twice a month. And it'll be a jumbo size rat that I'm giving them or, or a quail. 
Um, I gave him a large quail. And um, I, I try to keep them long and lean because everything that I see in the wild from Ari's pictures and everybody else's um, from old books and everything else, these animals are always long and lean. Uh, but I've seen a lot of captive animals that are gigantic. They look like Burmese pythons for their length, you know, and I don't think those animals are going to be viable or reproduce. Although I went to Paul Miles' place. He used to be with Pete Cullen called the Boa Barn. And when they split up, Paul had a breeding facility and he was the, the very first person to breed Bo and I. So I got to visit his um, place the year he bred them and hold his animals. And his female was actually quite large, but Paul was never able to reproduce that um you know, success either. He did it one time and that was it. He could never do it again. I'm uh, curious. I'm curious what, what I'm sure you've gone down at night, middle of the night and, you know, obviously daytime and, and, and where, when do you notice it the most active? I mean, do, do you notice that they are all over the place at night or? Are no, they I, I, they're mostly diurnal from what I see. Um, I have cameras on them so I can watch them anytime I want on my phone. Right. Um, and I think due to the nature of their habitat being, it, I mean, they can get frost where they're at, um, right. you know, so I don't think they're coming out at night. They, they're definitely an animal that lives for the sun. Um, and, you know, that was some of my theories when I started working with these guys that they're deprived of that. They get two months of sunshine, um, you know, where it's more available to them out of the year. And the rest of the time, it's like a cloudy, misty, um, overcast sky. So for those two months, they can really bask a lot. So then we take these animals, we put them in captivity, and we give them basking daily. And this animal is programmed to take advantage of basking when it's available to them. So are they, my theory was, are they over basking in captivity yeah. and, and gaining too much heat and UVB? And, you know, maybe that's one of the things that's maybe affecting because even the people that are successful getting a, a clutch, the, the viability of that clutch is usually terrible. You know, there's only a couple fertile eggs or no fertile eggs. So are we doing something for the males, um, you know, with too much basking exposure? So I don't know. You know, a lot of people condemn me because I play around and try to alter things a lot too. But what's the definition of insanity is keep it doing the same thing over and over again and, and expecting different results. Right. So I try to change it up and do stuff, but you know, then I swing back to, you know, just leave them alone and let them do their thing, give them a lot of options and let's see what happens. I mean, this, this, this whole game is wrapped around, you know, evolving and uh, getting complacent and just doing things because you think that's the bare minimum or whatever. It's, it's not, it's not the idea, you know, it, the fact yeah. that you, continuously looking for different ideas is what we all should be doing like that's right. that's that's the whole fucking plan even if you're good at bringing something you should still find better ways you know what i mean like even if you have it down like there we could always be better at it at it absolutely you know what I mean? um what i'm curious is you know you you have some people who think these are high ground snakes or low ground snakes i mean you, you know you, you find these in high areas and low low areas do you see yours perched up a lot in in high high places of the enclosure or do you see them burrowed more, more than likely um the, the picture you have up right there is the typical way you'll find the bull and i and and they're typically on the ground and they're pretty centered and uh they're, they're pretty like set in their ways for um you know just kind of hanging out but when they when they're feeding they'll they'll definitely use the branches in their enclosure they'll be all over that cage you'll be up in the branches and they're investigating everything so i'm sure in the wild um, they're doing the same thing. Um, they're probably when they're on the hunt, they're out and about and climbing and everything else. But typically, I think they're in their barrel or they're coming out when the sun is out and basking. And as soon as that sun goes in, they're back in their barrel if they're not hunting. We're going to get into this other topic of bowling. But before I do that, Keith, I didn't, you know, I, I didn't know about the uh, the Matt Minot Minotola thing because there's another guy I could really use your help on getting on this show. And, and he knows I've been on a bumper for a while. And shout out to one of the best short tail blood python breeders I've ever met for sure. My boy, Elijah Armis from Juggernaut yeah. Reptiles. Thank you for the super chat, my man, Elijah. But you guys have some history together, huh? You, you, you and Elijah are friends. I have from what I yeah, heard. so I, Elijah and I are friends, obviously, through the blood pythons. Um, right. Uh, that's how we got to know each other. But Elijah actually has a green Sanzini here that I'm working with. Yeah. I bred, I bred that last year. So Elijah's raising up, you know, he got his cut out of the litter 
he's raising up a couple animals right now. Elijah is a great dude. He hooked me up with some amazing, amazing um, uh, um, Kandoya, some uh, Solomon Island ground boas. Some oh, beautiful, okay. Yeah, some beautiful. He gave me two little white males that are nice. the best I've ever seen. And uh, I got a collection of those, so these males are going to definitely be put to use in the future. So, yeah, Elijah's a great dude. Put a little pressure on him for me. Like he's, it's, 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 it's at any day now. Like, listen, he, he's, we, we see each other in person, even at shows. And it's, it's just a matter of time. I feel like Keith, you could, you could give him that final, like, Hey bro, just, just you, you got to realize a lot of us snake guys, you know, like you, like you, this comes natural for you. You can just, you got the gift to gab, you know, some of us are the, the reason we're snake dudes is because we like to hang out in a room by ourselves looking at snakes, you know, <laughs> and, and talking comes hard, you know, <laughs> But you know, I'm telling you, man, people, I listen, I just, I, at the end of the day, I'm passionate of getting people on who I respect. Um, and Elijah's is somebody, I, shit, he's the reason why I still have short tails. Like I said, I had a group at one point and I let him, I let majority of that go, but I had some Elijah's productions. I'm like, I'm not letting these go. These are staying with me. Yeah. And I will keep this legacy going for him because, you know, I admire the man's work. So anyways, yeah. you're my boy, you know, I know, I know it will happen at some point and, uh, I will say uh, I, that green Sanzini he has is, is becoming more greener and greener every time I see it. Uh, yeah. So I, th I think that's awesome. Uh, but back to the Bolins topic here. Um, since you've had Bolins since what, the 80s? How, how, how far back do you and Bolins go? When, when did you start? Well, yeah, when I had them originally, I had one animal because they, they've always been expensive, not like they are nowadays, which I don't think is a good thing. But um, that's, back that's then that's exactly what I was going to get to is the, <laughs> the pricing, bro. The, the ticket on these almost impossible, you know, and this, and that's what makes me mad is there are people out there who deserve to have snakes like these because they're good. Like there's people, yeah, absolutely. Could, there's people out there who could possibly figure it out, but there's people out there who don't have $20,000 to invest in a pair. You know what I mean? And, yeah. and that, it's a lot, it's almost, almost impossible. Like it sucks yeah. that it's like, that. what's your stand yeah. on that right now? Yeah, have, having a pair of animals is like standing on one leg and trying to race somebody, you know. It, it, you lose one animal and you're done. You need, just like I was talking about Corrales before, you know, you need multiple animals to see which pair clicks. And by by having this, so so these high price tags do a lot of things, you know. Everybody knows the story of, of bull and babies that coming into the country and how they get here. And the problem is, is that by having these exorbitant prices on them, it, it becomes very cutthroat out in the wild and getting animals into the country now because there's a lot of money to be made. So the guys that have been supporting their families for, you know, many, many years and, and doing it, you know, not trying to uh, rate the hobby. Um, now you got other people that will go in and do whatever they got to do to get these animals and get them into to the United States and Europe and everything else. So, you know, the guys that were making all the money supporting their family in the past now have been kind of bullied out of what they were doing for many, many years. And, and these people that could care less about the animals and just care about the money are coming into it. Um, so that hurts. And and like you said, you know, I don't know what people's finances are in the hobby, but like Ryan Young should be working with Bull and I. Yes. Right? You Dennis. know what I mean? And Dennis. And there's a ton of people that we can list a ton of people that if we were all working on it together as a collective project to try to produce these things so that they're going to be established if the doors ever close, this is an animal that's going to go away because nobody's breeding. So Can we give our hats off to Ryan Young real quick? I mean, Ryan Timo, Young's a man. A, without a doubt. Fucking man, bro. Like, I'm so inspired to, like, just to be on that man's level at some point with just the project, you know, because if you're going to have all this shit, you better do something with it. And Ryan yeah. Young does something with it. Shout yeah, to Ryan Young. Not yeah, absolutely. Hey, while we're doing shout outs, I'm going to give my grandson a shout out. Today's his birthday and he's a mini me. And the kid is so doing? into animals. Um, What's, his so name? What's his name? Colt. Colt Pap. He, 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 he gets a shout out for Pop today. <laughs> Happy birthday, Colt. How old did Colt turn today? Colt turned seven today and he got a bearded dragon from Pop. And uh, he calls my, my wife. His grandma, he calls her Burger. We have no idea why, but she's Burger. <laughs> So Pop and Burger got Colt a bearded dragon, and, and Mom and Dad got him a nice setup. And Colt's uh, first own reptile is now a bearded dragon. He's doing great. 
since we're on the topic of family and whatnot, you know, obviously coming, you know, ke- you know, keeping the stuff that we're talking about, you know, it's, you know, you got to be on your shit, you know, and not, not every family, like wife or other family members are on board when people are passionate about keeping reptiles. Like you, you know, have, like the stars all have to align. And I'm curious, right. was there ever a point, you know, on your up and coming, raising a family where like, you know, safety was an issue at all. And you're like, holy, or did you always have, you know, your one-on-ones locked down? Would you, or was that never an issue with you? I'm just curious. Well, so I had mentioned I was working with Burmese pythons, right? And, um, right. And, and so it was a night when my first daughter was born and, you know, my wife had a C-section. So I was up at night trying to make bottles and take care of things wow. um, with the baby. So, um, I had remembered that I had thought out a bunch of rabbits uh, for the berms. And while I was heating up a bottle for my daughter, I was like, you know what? I got to go downstairs. I forgot I had these rabbits out. I got to feed these berms. So I go downstairs. Now I'm in a rush to get back upstairs, you know? So these rabbits were in the snake room and the berms are all worked up. Right. And I'm opening doors and putting rabbits in. Well, the, the I swing the rabbit in. The female berm sees my hand move and smells the rabbit. She nails me. So Ooh. I had, I had, and she's about 18 feet. Oh, so I, have, I had to pull her, I have to pull her out of the cage and get her on the floor. Cause I didn't want her to wrap me up around my chest and my, you know, diaphragm and all that. So I get her on the floor. She's wrapping up my legs and you know, I, now I'm hog tied. I'm in the basement. I get, she's on my hand. I got my hand on her head and she's all around my legs and I'm tied up in the basement. Meanwhile, my hot water, my butt, my bottle's boiling upstairs. I got a crying baby waiting to be fed. And I'm downstairs hollow time. My wife just had a C-section. Oh and I, I had no choice. I had to start yelling to Teresa to come down and give me a hand, you know? So she comes down. We get the snake off me. We get her back in the cage. And we went upstairs to feed the baby. And I had to take care of my hand. I mean, I was bleeding really bad. And wow. she called the neighbor next door. You know, you don't want any kind of publicity for something like that. She comes over. She was a nurse. She kind of bandaged me up with some butterflies and this and that. Nice. And um, we started, you know, to feed Jesse. And we, we had a good conversation that night. We're like, you know what? This is, this is a time when we shouldn't have these big animals in the house, you know, because I'm not focused. I'm, I got to take care of the kids and, and having these big animals, if you're not focused, um, isn't a good thing. You know, so we made the choice then to get rid of those big animals for sure. Here's the thing, man. Even if you are the most focused motherfucker on earth, mistakes happen. Like you're, oh, you yeah. don't understand that it, it it comes with the territory, like bites. I guarantee everyone who keeps big snakes have a bite story. You know what I mean? Right. Um, it's just fucking how bad is it going to happen? It comes down to luck. You know what right. I mean? And, and, and you just never know. You know what I mean? And I don't know. This is why I don't have kids yet, you know. But I knew when I had 12 mainlands, I was like, this isn't going to be a feasible lifestyle. I can't. Right. I was like, I'm already like sweating balls and scared myself. Imagine doing this with kids or like just anything in more in the mix. And honestly, keeping these big snakes were, were holding me back from everything else that I wanted to fucking put every my heart and soul in. They're not right. easy. Right. I, right. Tip my, I tip my hat to big snake keepers because you must really love this animal because it comes with a lot of responsibility. Absolutely. Work dedication and that's why I like I was no problem like I have two pair I have a pair of super dwarfs which the adult is females 10 feet and the male six feet I'll never go over that ever in my life ever again even right. that like you know luckily I'm doing good on the breeding but that is a project where if I need to put it in someone else's hands I have no problem doing it because I'm trying to limit my case of getting hurt like you know what I right. mean like well well, that's the, that's the other thing. Like, th- there's that uh, video floating around on the internet again right now on Facebook of that woman that oh that retake. Yeah, yeah. 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 Why well, you can tell it's totally food ready out. for feeding. Yeah, they had you know? food out too. I guess yeah. the lady they had they were thawing out food. Like they're about to feed yeah. it. She's doing that. What yeah. the hell? So, so so with my bite, you know, obviously having experience, your your muscle memory kicks in, and you know what to do to avoid it get escalating. You can de escalate the situation where. The problem is, is when people like her that don't know what to do, they they escalate the situation and make it worse and cause more injury to themselves and to the animal. I, I, I suffered punctures that were pretty severe, but that was it, you know, and the snake didn't suffer anything. Right. And, and because I knew what to do, my wife knew what to do. But, you know, some of these people, you know, that are getting these big snakes, I'm not so sure they should, you know, they should take a class or something before they get them. 
I, I, I mean, you should at least have somebody who's willing to help you work with them. Because I can a tell mentor. You, yeah, or yeah, and, or just someone like to like. I feel like a, any snake at a certain size needs two people at least. Like, don't ever fucking don't fuck around and, and do this by yourself, you know. And the thing is, I didn't want to have my wife help me wrestle these big ass snakes. I was like, I'm not gonna help yeah. like put you in this this position that I put myself in. So yeah, I, Tracy Barker taught me a long time ago when when her and Dave were up in Maryland. You know, her rule of thumb was anything over nine feet you don't handle by yourself in the collection. You know, if you're working yeah. with something over nine feet. You have somebody else in the room. Right. Right. So, okay. I'm curious, Keith, you know, we were talking about earlier when we first started this podcast, you know, this year's looking good for you as far as like, you know, things are rolling and, 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 and I'm curious as far as like what projects you're very excited about or, or what things are you, you could maybe tell us that, or maybe looking in your favor this year. Um, all right. I mentioned a few of them. I mean, I, I, I MJ, I was so I was like so confident on the bull and I this year, you know. Um, she was yeah. building so good. I did something a little different this year. I had two males in there uh, with her, and they were, you know, doing some light combating and both struggling together. And it's something that Arias talked to the locals that they've seen two males with females. So um, then the big male got a little bit too rough with the do uh, less dominant male, so I had to pull him out, but. I figured all that interaction was like a real good thing for stimulating that female to go the distance this year. But I think the fat lady saying, man, I don't think I'm going to do it again this year, but I was real ho hopeful for that. But, um, but I did a lot of colubrids this year. I have uh, Arizona mountain Kings. I have rigor Cal Kings. I have uh, Zanata, the, um, and, and I think I said Arizona. How many and speckled things. How many Kluber clutches are you producing every year? Do you have like something that you stay consistent on or is it fluctuate yeah you know what it is i have so many species that i try to pick like maybe you know five to seven projects that i want to work on that year um and and those are the animals i concentrate on and the other animals get on the back burner so um i have rhino rat eggs right now i hatched some woma out just recently the sanzinia i have a gravid girl there i have um a gravid hog isle boa um I have the Rochenberger eye that looks good. I have an annulated boa that looks good. Uh, what else? Does everything, everything happen usually around the same time? Like, you know, once these boas start to drop, is it kind of like clockwork with all the other stuff too? Or is it, it all? It, it is because I coined that term a while ago, the rhythm of the room. And, right. you know, my, my, my room definitely has that rhythm. So, you know, I'm, I've finally gotten that back. When I had my blood pythons, I can pretty much tell you, like this week in July, even though it's December, is when I'm going to be getting all my eggs because that's just how it worked every year. Right. Um, so now I'm kind of getting that vibe back with the animals in, in this room and everything I'm doing now. So typically the boas are, you know, August, September, October. And, you know, the clubbers are obviously in the spring, as, as are the pythons. And I'm curious to ask you, Keith, because you, you've always had a nine to five, right? You Like you said, you... you yeah. Three nine to five on top of the animals, and yeah. you've, been doing, you've been doing the animals all your whole life. There's never been a point in time that you looked at the animals of something that could be a full time thing. Like that was never ever a thought in your mind. So so no, because I think for me it would take the passion away and it becomes a business, and I don't want to ever get to that point. Um, because there's just too much pressure on, you know, taking care of your family at, at that point. And, and I don't want them to be a come a commodity to me right now. If, if one of my buds calls me up and says, Hey Keith, I need um, like a pair of Woma are going to Craig Trumbauer. Cause he said, you know, some of the bigger stakes he's going to get rid of because he doesn't, he doesn't feel comfortable handling them anymore at his age. So right. I'm going to hook him up with a pair of Woma. I like being able to, you know, if Paul needs something that I produce, I'm going to send it to Paul. I don't want to have to sell animals to, to make a living. I want to enjoy the animals. I want to keep that passion alive that I've had for 62 years now and uh, just keep it going. What are your thoughts about, you know, somebody coming into the ball python game and being able to do this for a full-time living after three, four years and, and making a lot of money. Like, I mean, the whole morph thing, you know, I know one thing that's not really uh, too, uh, yeah, you know, very happy about in the Facebook community or ball python breeders, I could, from what I can see. Um, but to, to be truth, there's a lot of money to be made in the ball python game. 
Um, Absolutely. But do, do you feel like because the demands, even though the demand's so high with the ball python, you could sell a five ten thousand dollar animal if you have the right following. Do you feel like that's still not something to want to do a business with, it, even with those kind of increments? For me, no, not at this stage of my life. Um, because again, like I say, for for me, I think I think something that you're really passionate about like that, right? It puts a lot of a lot of pressure on you to be that guy that produces that next one. And when you fail, like I take stuff like that too much to heart. Right. And I, I don't like failing at anything like that, you know? So I, I put too much pressure on myself and, and, and it wouldn't be fun anymore um, right. to me. So I, I don't care if I could make $300,000 at it right now at this point in the, in the year, I, I still wouldn't do it as a business. Respect to the guy right here with the super chat. Benny Brett Bender, good buddy of mine, uh, also breeds Wilmas. Oh, that was one of my babies, yeah. He wants to, Benny, Brett, Brett Bender wants to know, what does it take to get one of Keith's Wilmas? <laughs> Brett, Brett and I have been going back and forth. He's definitely on my list, so I got some babies down establishing and getting going, so I'll be, I'll be in touch with Brett. But not so easy as well, am I correct? Like, I mean, this is also something where, like, you know, I, from the, even the most, uh, you know, experienced breeders – sometimes have a little bit of a trouble establishing these. Is that correct? So far for me, Womas have been pretty easy. They've definitely been one of the easier species that I've worked with to get going. Um, right. If you understand the animals and how they are in nature and setting them up in that way as a neonate, um, I think they tend to feed a lot better. You know, it's all about security and how that animal attains security in the wild. And you set them up in that way and, and they take off pretty well then. Now, as far as you getting your first uh, Womo project uh, uh, eggs or whatnot, when did this happen? When did you start? How long have you been breeding Womos for? Um, Womos took me a little bit of time to get going. I had animals that I raised and, and got to what I thought was breeding age and saw copulation. And, you know, I was wondering why the heck I wasn't getting eggs. But it took about three years of doing that. On um, my animals becoming like mature at like six, seven years old, uh, when I thought they were ready at like four years old, um, before I started being successful with them and, and producing them all the time. Now, I, I've noticed, you know, like Benny, you know, Benny Bender has really high orange contrast looking Wilmas, and then you have these really nice looking yellow ones. Like, why, why do they come in such different colors? I mean, is it locality or is it just like the, the, the based off the parents? I'm curious on the, uh, the difference with on how these Wilmas could look. Yeah. So that on my animals, it seems like minor um, Miller line. I got uh, a female from Lon Dexler and I got um, a male from Josh Trout. Actually, I got a couple animals from Josh and they're all Miller line. And uh, some of mine, they seem to have like a reduced neck pattern. And right. um, I sent some pictures to Scott Iper and he looked at him and, and I said, is this like a locality thing over there? And he, he gave me a location that um, they resemble animals from the wild. So, yeah, it seems like with Wilma's that there's, you know, locality differences in the, in the look of the animals. So I think uh, some of the genetics are in there. And if you just hit on the right, getting the right pairs together, you produce animals that look like that locality. And what's the game plan this year with Wilma's? Are you still have these going or is this a no longer project? Uh, no, I'll keep the, the animals I have for breeding, but I, I tend to not even really hold any back right now. Okay. Um, so the project is what I have right now. I'm not looking to build on it. And they seem to be popular with a couple of the people that I really respect in the industry. So if I can get them in their hands and they can do future projects with them, that's awesome for me. I like seeing it. I don't mean to be bouncing back and forth, but there's one topic that I, I have to bring up um, that <laughs> verts back to emeralds because I've yet to have any anaconda phases in my collection. Uh, I got some nice ones. Dude, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I want to know more about the anaconda phase. Like, is this is this from a certain part from where they're located? Um, and, and, and is this something where you need another anaconda phase to get anaconda phases? Like, from what are your knowledge behind the anaconda phase? So just all I know is what I've done to um, to um, breed them and what my results have been. But right. anaconda, anaconda will produce anaconda in the litter, but I also get animals with very low white on them. Mm -hmm. um, 
but I do get some really nice anaconda phase when I breed anaconda, anaconda. If I breed anaconda to a normal looking um, emerald, I can also get a lesser amount of anaconda in the, in the breeding, um, but more animals with, you know, more white on them than I would if I had done anaconda to anaconda. So, right. Uh, yeah, I don't know the genetics in the wild. Um, if it's just an anomaly that pops up and it is a genetic trait, um, and that's what it could be in the wild. Um, just the right pairing gets together and you get animals that are produced like this. It's almost like the, uh, like, you know how on the neck on most Northerns gets that sooty, the white turns to that sooty color. It's almost like that sooty color is just in all the marks that would have been white on the animal all the way down. The patternless animals are more intriguing to me than the anaconda. I have a, a female I didn't send you a picture on. She has like really like no markings on her whatsoever. Those are pretty intriguing. I mean, I've even seen anaconda phases just like that look just like a, almost like a chondro, like just straight green, like no, like no pigments of nothing. But this, yeah. is, my, this is my idea of anaconda phase, like this, the, you know, the, the black subtle uh, little dots that you could see uh, going yeah. along in body like that's uh, this is such an impressive animal and and i feel like you know you know do what you want but it doesn't make sense to breed this anaconda to anything else but another anaconda like yeah i have enough anacondas that i that's what i do i just now i just breed anaconda to anaconda at this point and i do have a, a gravid female actually right now <laughs> keith you're on fire buddy <laughs> oh my god now do you feel like um I don't know. Do you, you, there was a substantial break you took last year with some of your projects, right? Like you didn't just go full blown like you're doing this year, or or did you have everything still going as much as you did this year as well? Last year? Uh, no, last year I definitely didn't. This this year was a very conscious effort um, to focus on the animals and and focus more on feeding and 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 getting them for breeding condition, you know. So that's why I'm just doing. And animals, like, I, I really slow grow the connect, uh, collection this time. Right. Um, so animals are really just coming up to size since from 2000, you know, like I say, 15, 16, 17. Just got animals up to size and age and all now. So I'm just starting to really concentrate back on breeding again. Do you think that, that that little year off had a big influence on why things are going well this year? Like, do you feel like, you know... It definitely like, could have helped, you know, that... Uh, 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 Feast and famine with reptiles is a good thing, I think, you know, uh, for sure. Um, that constant good life doesn't go well with a lot of species for uh, uh, reproduction purposes, you know. Right. Now, I mean, as far as how things are looking this year, um, I mean, let's just talk about the best year ever had production-wise. I, I mean, you don't have an Instagram. You're not advertising anything like that. I mean, is most of your stuff that you're letting go to are friends or close peers or do you ever go to shows in bend or like wh where have you ever like sold a lot of your productions at um so orlando i did for 20 years i did that oh, show wow. for 20 years so wow, um, that was, yeah. that was something. i did that from day one i i used to go you, obviously you've heard of quetzal and oh yeah quetzal, yeah. Yeah. I, I, yeah i met him through new york reptilia he used to work there and uh, the guys that own New York Reptilia used to vend um, the Orlando show. And what they would do is just get an extra table for me because at that time it was impossible to get in. So they would just get So I was, I've was i been doing that show pretty much since day one. Um, and then when I got out of Bloods, I stopped. You know, I used to get four tables and just pack it with every – it was shock and awe. I'd bring, you know, a couple hundred blood pythons and just put them on uh, my tables. And, you know, th that's what I – I made a lot of connections then. So, um, you know, I have people buying from around the world and, and just friends. And, you know, I, I don't do it to, like I say, to make any money or anything else. I'm just doing it kind of, you know, because it's my passion. So getting rid of the babies has always been an easy thing for me. I've never had an issue with that. You know, it's funny. It's like because, like you said, it's not the priority. Like you're not you're not sitting here thinking like I need to sell this snake. I need to sell this snake. It's kind not of like. All. It's like the, the buyer needs you more than we need, you know, than you need us, right? You know, and then, yeah, that's, go ahead. And one thing that um, I found over the years, especially when I was really doing the bloods heavy, was it's good to hold animals back because you know what? You're always going to sell an animal. I, I just yeah. as an example, I sold an animal to Dennis McNamara. Dennis is a great guy. Dennis raised it up. It was an expensive animal. 
he got that female to breeding size and she got egg bound on him and she and she she was she was not breedable and now he, dennis had, was younger at the time he invested a lot of money in that project i felt terrible guess what i had an animal that i had held back because i had a bunch of animals that i had bought it was an adult female ready to go so guess what dennis got he got an adult female to replace that female for me for free and, and and he was able to he was able to 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 go ahead with that project so i've always liked that's what builds a reputation in this hobby right so having animals back that you can replace something for somebody who's doing the right thing, not somebody who's pressuring you, but somebody that's doing the right thing with the animals, man, if I can help them out and they made a big purchase for me, I'm going to help them out any way I can down the road. You know what I mean? That builds a good reputation. I tell you right now, man, what changed my whole perspective with life. I came in here, I came in here pretty fucked up. Like I had a really weird vision of life. Didn't trust nobody. And, I just had these people taking care of me, like you know, like like my boy Miguel Garcia, who's really well respected in the ball python game. Like he would he would put you know two thousand dollars snakes in my hand, like here man, breed this. Like I feel like you're gonna right. do it. And I'm like, what do you want? What do you, I I can't pay you for this. He's like, I don't want you to pay me. He's like, I just believe in you. And like I want you to we'll deal with it when you breed it. And I'm like, what? Like I never had that before. And 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 just that kind of taste of like what that does doing something for somebody made me want to do that for somebody else. And I never. Absolutely. I never cared about nobody. I was a selfish motherfucker, you know, and, and I'm, I've come a long ways, but I can tell you right now that, that what you put out comes back is a true real deal thing, man. If you, you know, that, that feeling of you getting taken care of, pass that down, please. That's all I got to say. Absolutely. I got, I got, I got a lot of animals in the basement right now that are from other people and it's because they trust me. And that is awesome to me. Like that's, that's the thing for me, man. I, I want to work with kindred souls and further the hobby and and get people like inspired to do real good with the animals and take care of the animals and just like you know look at them in awe and not as a as a status symbol you know respect the animal i always say see see the see the snake through the morph you know what i mean and, and love it for what it is so working with paul and and all these different people um in my own collection it's, it's just freaking awesome i love it yeah all right, one thing we haven't covered yet, and I'm curious because uh, I mean I've admired your trips that you take, man. You've been in Australia. Uh, yeah. Um, guess who's going to Australia again? <laughs> when? When is this happening? Uh, and this time I'm bringing Teresa with me. She, that, you know, talk about uh, the supportive family. You know, she's. Yeah, shout out to Teresa. I just want to say shout out to Teresa. She's a real one. They one right there. Yeah. Shout out. yeah. So we're going. Uh, we're going to be going in October again, and. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to go as many times as my body will do it, man, because hey, are you I started going back, too late. You're going to the same place that you flew last time, or are you going to a different part of Australia? We're, your we're going to a different, a different part, yeah, see some different stuff. Um, what, what are you looking for this time? Um, a, lot, a lot of gecko species, a lot of carpet species, um, uh, different animals. You know, Rob Stone puts together these amazing trips. The guy's phenomenal. Right. And, um, he, he's putting together a trip. So, yeah, it's going to be amazing. Can't wait. Where's this uh, pig taken at? This looks like a, a boa species in your hand, if I'm if I'm mistaken. or, or I don't know. That is a species that probably less than, I'm going to say, 10 people in the United States have ever held. Wow. That's, a, that's an Owen Pelly python. Oh, shit. And okay. that's a Gavin. So I don't know if you know the story, but when I went with the NPR boys, our goal was to find an Owen Pelly python. And even the guys in Australia is like, just don't even think about it. You're never going to find one. No, nobody finds these things. Like he, there's people that live in Australia that have looked for them for 20 years and don't find one. Well, guess what? We did find one. We found a, a beautiful, like 12 foot animal. And uh, Gavin Bedford has been working with these animals and he's been breeding and doing amazing work with them. Well, that's the night I met Gavin. He brought a captive born baby old Pelly Python for us and the guys to check out and, and get hands on and really, you know, see what they're all about. And you're, you're right to me. That looks like an Amazon tree bow in build. Yeah. Um, but these animals get huge. If you saw the big animal that Gavin has, I mean, they can eat rock wallabies as adults. So for Jeez. that snake to eat a rock wallaby, give you an idea how big they can get. But this one, this one you're holding is from the wild, right? No, that's a captive-born baby that Gavin bred. Um, we were look, we were looking for carpet pythons with Gavin. Uh, he did um, a paper on on carpet pythons, and we're in the area that uh, where he studied the carpet pythons. So he was showing us what to look for, 
And he pulls out a bag and he goes, I got a surprise for you guys. And he pulls out a baby Owen Pelly. And I'm telling you, I, I, I don't know how many people have held an Owen Pelly python in the country, but I can tell you it's less than, than on your hands probably. It's that rare. So that was a highlight of my lifetime right there to hold that snake. And like really like, I mean, I don't know. I'm sure, I don't know if it matters, but the time of year that you go to Australia, I mean, what, what would you say the best time is? Is, is it October or like, what would you want? It, to it depends. You know, we, tr we try to go in between, well, the areas that we went to. Rob, like I said, Rob Stone is the man. He plans these trips out. It takes him months and months and months. People think it's herping is easy. It's not. It's easy for me because I just show up. And these guys did all this hard work, you know, they, they search and search and search. Just, they'll look at a road and see how many, let's say, blackhead pythons were found on that road and what month was the best month of blackheads being found on that road or whatever, you know, and they put together this trip at the best time of the year. Right. So that trip we went in October because it was just the very beginning of the rainy season. And in the area we were going to, like, if you didn't have this, like, rugged four-wheel drive with a um, you know, snorkel intake for the air and all this stuff. I mean, the, the businesses there are closed down for the rainy season because everything just floods and you can't get around over there. Right. So, you know, we timed it to get just before that starts because that's when the animals are getting really active. Um, so, yeah, we found blackheads and we found brown water pythons and, and we just found so many animals, frilled dragons. and It, it was a unbelievable brown carpets and oh, we found the old belly python. It was amazing. You've been to Indonesia or any of those places yet? Like South Asia? Ari, Ari, Ari is trying to get me to go with him to Papua. Before COVID, things have changed now. And Ari hasn't been back since then. You know that. Um, and he, supposedly he's going. Like He told me. He, there's, yeah. yeah. He's, got a, he's got a trip planned. He sure does. Wow. So I'm super yeah. stoked for him. But, you know, yeah. listen, you go to Australia, you, you worry about a kangaroo. There's no, like political unrest or anything you know you go to Papua it's, it's a different thing like Ari's been doing it a long time yeah. and he knows how to blend and fit in you know I, I would be a headhunter's dream you know? <laughs> <laughs> they put me on a spear or something I don't know man um, I think Ari's the type to join the headhunting help him kill the person yeah exactly <laughs> okay. I mean he's, eat, he's okay. eating fruit bat over there you know what I mean yeah he don't go <laughs> oh man now I mean I gotta ask you this um do you have any other big plans? I mean, I know you have a closed off collection, right? But I mean, are, are there anything species wise that you haven't had yet? That is a possible possibility that you could have in your collection at some point that, that is maybe lingering that you could, that you know of. Yeah. I mean, um, so, you know, luckily being in the game so long, yeah, have friends like Warren Booth and, and other people, you know what I mean? So, yeah. you know, let, let's just say Warren Booth, you know, was breeding the Trinidad Rochenberger eye for a while and had some babies. I'd love to get some babies from Warren, you know, and then having a closed collection and getting an animals from somebody like Warren, you don't worry so much, you know, I'm not buying them off a morph market or something else. You're getting them from a guy that you've known for a long time and he knows you and, you know, you're getting something pretty trustworthy and goes through the standard quarantine and goes into your collection. But um, yeah, man, I've, I've pretty much kept everything. I, I will tell you that, um, you know, as you start getting older and reality of mortality sets in and all that kind of stuff, I could see myself in the future probably going back to a more lizard collection, something more manageable. Um, dwarf monitors, I did a, a, a pretty long, um, you know, stint with dwarf monitors. I bred Kimberly's and store. Those, eye and, those are, those are hot right now. Like those dwarf monitors are selling like hotcakes right now. Yeah. But uh, you know, I could see myself because they're very interactive and as you get older and slow down and, you know, maybe not wanting to handle the bigger snakes. I mean, bowl and I, they're a formidable animal really. If, if you go in there at the wrong time when they're in feeding mode, you know, you got to watch yourself with them. They're like, very, very amethystian python, like, you know, scrub python, like, um, so, you know, as you, you get in your seventies, late seventies, I could see myself working with more lizard species and less snakes, you know, for sure. And get right. back into that where I started it all, you know, lizards were actually my thing back when I was a kid. That was the thing that I always wanted. You know, I had iguanas and horned lizards and green lizards and jewel lizards and all that kind of stuff. Right. Awesome.
Well, check this out, Keith. I have a wrap-up question before we get into some hot seat questions, okay? Um, and this is basically going to be a topic around the, the room that you actually have, like the stuff that you keep your room in, right? Um, the, the caging you have, I mean, you have, I have a picture of you, um, and, and I believe in, in your room. I don't know if this is a current picture, but I want to kind of break this down because I see some uh, – are, are these custom cages to your left, like the wood cages or uh – -huh. I build almost everything. Um, the tubs on the other side are for growing up emeralds, and I, that's what I do really well with. So that's what I stick with. The animals do great in them. And the pythons and bigger animals go in the custom cages that I build. Um, those cages actually right there that you're looking at are about oh, damn close to 40 years old. Wow. Damn. Yeah. And, and they're still rolling to this day. Those are still downstairs. Or, or, or where, yeah. in, where's your room? Where, where, where is, I, uh, I have uh, I have two snake rooms down in the basement. Um, oh. That's one of the rooms there. So, yeah. Are they separated? Like, so they're in the basement? Yeah. They're in different rooms? Um, yeah, they're just separated from each other from a, by a door. There's a door separating the two rooms. And, um, yeah, no, those cages have served me well. There's been a lot of different species in those cages, you know. Through the years, there's been a lot of animals in there. And with that being said, you know, daytime light cycling, nighttime, nighttime. I mean, how important do you feel like the the exposure to light, like even UBV, it, it, how important is it in your in your eyes, you feel like? Well, so some species, for sure, I think it's super important. I, I don't know if you noticed in that picture, but over my shoulder, there's actually a, ba a basement window in there. Right. And, and those animals definitely key into that. Uh, exterior lighting, even if you're using right up uh, over my one shoulder, you can yeah, kind of see that. Yeah, that's it. Um, they'll key into that uh, ambient lighting coming in from the outside. Even if you light cycling with uh, lights on the cages, they key into that, man. I mean, when it's springtime, those animals are on that, and that's when all my breeding happens, you know. So having a, a window in your room, I think, is super important if you're yeah. trying to create a, a rhythm to the room. Uh, that definitely helps a lot. But, yeah, there's species like bull and I, obviously, Dom, diamond pythons um, that I think UV is is huge for. Um, then there's other species, you know, like um, like the, the mountain king snakes or something where I don't, you know, they're a lot of times very nocturnal. So I don't know how important it is for species like that. Obviously, snakes have been kept with no UV for a long time and breed and everything else. But long term. Is it something? Absolutely. I think it's something that's good for the animals. And one last thing I forgot to hold, I totally forgot was how do you, how do you feed your collection? I mean, you raise your own rats or is it all frozen thawed? How, how do you feed your whole collection? So I, I used to breed and, and rodents also, which especially when I had the blood pythons, it was a lot cheaper to do um, obviously, but you know, time is money. And um, yeah. that's on awesome. top of, you know, I, I mean, I just couldn't do it anymore. It was just too much to take care of. So I have a, a local person that breeds for all the local pet stores and other collectors and keepers in my area. And I've been going to her now for probably like 15 years. Oh, anyway. nice. So I, I yeah, I, I drive every Saturday and pick up fresh stuff from her every Saturday. Got to love having a connection like that, man. I mean, yeah. that, that could really determine how far you go in this. Oh, some, absolutely. I, I hear some stories of people like having to go on missions just to get feeders for the week. And I'm like, oh, man, that's like, I mean, I'm blessed. You know, like I have Cool Blooded Cafe, but then I also have my live feeder company, which just right. like, drops off what I need. I call them Uber feeders, even though that's right. like, that would be a good name. I feel like Uber feeders. Like, come on. There you go. <laughs> I mean, I feel like that's also like, you know, I, I, I preach about this all the time, how, you know, certain things land in your lap where you know you're meant to work with these animals. And if you're in a position where the food is consistently there, that's a good sign. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, like, when you talk about going into business, I think if you're in business, you just about, you know, breeding reptiles, you just about have to breed your own feeders at that yeah. point. You know? You're stupid not to because you're, you're, your business is relying on someone else, which right. they Make it go out of business. Things happen. I mean, I've had a couple scares where I'm like, shit, two weeks. Like, I'm going to the pet store again. And, you know, luckily, you yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, think about people who, like, have to, like, go spend, you know, that, that one that one person who's trying to come up in the game. And, you know, something happens where they have to go to the pet store to get 100 feeders. Good luck with that, Bill. Right. Exactly. <laughs> Four dollars a yeah. rat. 
<laughs> yeah. I, I've seen rats here at our Petco. $26 yeah. for a large rat. Oh, my God. They're killing it. Can you it. imagine? <laughs> the fuck? They're, feed, they're feeding their whole employees lunch that day off that one rat. Yeah, crazy. Well, listen, uh, amazing episode, Keith. This has been a, an honor, like I said. Hopefully round two worthy. I hope I hope I can get you back on here someday uh, because uh, definitely something I, I feel like we could keep going for sure. I just don't want to keep you up all night. Uh, but I will say uh, thank you so much. This was great. We have hot seat questions, though, before uh, okay. – you're not out oh, of this. Oh, yeah, boy. Not, it's about to get serious. But, uh, yeah, here we go. Hot seat questions for Keith. Uh, dude, do me a favor. No explanation if you can. Just, you know, quicker the better. You know, okay. you, you know, you feel me? But if you have to explain it, I understand. Okay? So here we go. Hot seat questions. Keith McPeak. You ready, Keith? I'm ready. All right. Coming in hot. Frozen thought or live? Live. A cut or no cut? No cut. Red Condro Neo or yellow Condro Neo? Red. Northerns or basins? Northern. Pre first shed meal or post first shed meal? Post. Yay imports or boo imports? Oh, that one needs an explanation, but I'm going to say yay imports. One reptile you could import today anywhere around the world, what would it be? Doesn't matter. To a tower. <laughs> nice. Um, one reptile nobody should ever import ever again. Leave it alone. Don't touch it. Just leave it. Oh, and I. Wow. Respect. Um, to spray a reptile, like to mist, or to not spray a reptile? Mist. Big flexor or no flexor? <laughs> I don't know what that means, but I'm going to say big flexor. Yes, I love it. <laughs> big flexor. <laughs> Uh, yay sports or boo sports? Eh, sports. Favorite sport? Fishing. Nice. Fresh water or salt water? I'm, I'm assuming fresh. Both. Oh, both, dude. I'm out all the time, dude. I would love, if you ever make it out to San Diego, we go to Baja, man. We'll do some deep water. Well, I'm telling you, we get some, some Dorado and some Yellowtail. Oh, uh, yeah. We'll have a good That'd time. Be killer. That'd be killer. Yeah. Um, Van Halen or Sammy Hagar? I'm old school Van Halen. Thank you. Respect to that. Little word association. First thing to come to mind, milk. Sugar. Substrate. <laughs> Pine shavings. Mites. Kill them. First time ball python breeder. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> FedEx shipping. Eh. Reptile Facebook groups. Good. Wow, Keith. Oh, that's because everyone fucking respects the shit. They, they cherish the ground you walk on. That's why. <laughs> Nobody comes at you, Keith. No, I'm it. lucky. Just kidding. No, you're good. Now they're good now. <laughs> <laughs> Ovulation. Fantastic. If you had to get rid of one platform forever, and I'm pretty sad to say this because I think I know what's going to happen, but if you had to get rid of one platform forever, are you going to get rid of Instagram or are you going to get rid of Facebook? Which one has to go? <laughs> it has to be Facebook. It's the only one I'm on. Yeah, so wait, Facebook needs to stay and Instagram needs to go is what you're saying? No, I'm saying my life would probably be better if Facebook would go. Oh, wow. Respect. You're doing the mature thing. You know Facebook is that. <laughs> wow. There you go. You have it. Keith, amazing two hours, 20 minute episode. What do you have to say? We had over 70 people in the in the in this uh, live all watching this. What do you have to say to everyone tapping in and supporting you, Keith? Wow, that's awesome. Thanks, guys. Uh, I was definitely nervous coming on where uh, it was going to be talking like this and no editing. Um, so I really appreciate you being gentle with me and asking all good questions. And it was a lot of fun. It was a lot awesome. of fun. Well, I appreciate you, Keith. I'm glad everything's well and on the up end. Um, like I said, Rochenberger I list and if and again the Conda Fates, let me know how it happens to you. Either way, I cannot wait to see updates, man. If you say you're a big flexor, which I know you are, you better be blasting these photos all over Facebook. And I cannot wait. I want to see this stuff, Keith. All right. All right. Thanks, man. I appreciate right. it. Have a good one. That's a wrap. Keith Peak, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> all right, Keith. Have a good night, man. Thank you so you much. You too. Thanks. Bye. Later. What a guy, man. Thank you so much. What an amazing episode. If you are uh, just tapped in or you tapped in later, 
hit that like button. Let's get the likes up for our man, Keith. What an amazing episode. This is just one round. I will bring him back on with somebody very player. Who should it be? Hmm, I'm not going to let you guys know that, but I'm going to be thinking about it. And, yes, again, I appreciate it. This was an amazing episode. Look, the homie Keith Flax in the building, another OG coming to show some respect. Mad love. Hit that subscribe button. I'm trying to get my subscribers up. 51% of my people who come watch my episodes aren't subscribed. Are you really one of those, like, 51%? Come on now. If you fuck with your boy, hit that subscribe button. It means a lot. Okay, guys, 200th episode special this Saturday. Canada, where you at? Are you excited? Because I'm excited to bring this couple back on the show. And we are going to tap in with our very favorite Canadian couple, Marcus and Jane of Marcus Jane Reptiles. Trap Talks 200th episode special! Going down this Saturday, 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. Tap in. We have lots to talk about. And yeah, man, again, thank you so much for tapping in. This was a very special episode. Thank you, Keith McPeak. Appreciate you so much for being such a legend, such an amazing guy. And I'll catch you guys this Saturday. Enjoy the rest of your week, and I'm out. Cheers!